Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. June 14th, 2019, episode 32. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Thanks for joining us this week. Today, we are joined by John Netto, author of The Global Macro Edge, where he talks to us about the science of maximizing return per unit of risk. Patrick has a great tale from the trading desk, and I'm taking over this week's market history segment for a definite macro tourist type lesson. And then we will end with our top five things to watch this week. All right, so let's jump into it, Kev. Uh, so, Lena, can you hop on here and tell us about this week's beer sponsor? Who's the show brought to us by this week? Well, the show is brought to us this week by Market Brewing Company. Um, this is a beer for you, Patrick. Bear Hug oh. IPA. I love the name. Yeah, do you know yeah. what? I, actually, I'm going to jump in here because I was thinking to myself, I didn't get the bear move I was expecting in bonds, and Patrick didn't get the bear move he was expecting in equities. So we are going to have the bear hug in our beer. That's right. Yes. <laughs> All right, Selena, tell us about this beer before so we pop beer this. This beer is a balanced IPA with big aromas of juicy pineapple, tangerine, and evergreen, hazy and deep in gold. Uh, it's hazy and deep golden color. A bready and light caramel base is the foundation for assertive bitterness with citrusy and dank flavors. All right. Dang. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting <laughs> word to okay. describe it. I, I, I will also say that I see they say, please note the beer is unfiltered and can have some sediment at the bottom of the can. This is not harmful if drunk. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Actually, he says if drank, but anyways, let's yeah. try it. That's nice. I actually like yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good beer. It's definitely a Patrick it's a good beer. beer. It's, uh, it's a fruity. I, I feel a oh, fruity. <laughs> <laughs> It's a Patrick beer. It's fruity. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm a sours guy, fruity guy. What else? So, right. on, label That's me right. here, guys. At All least right. this is a strong beer. So. Uh, yeah, seven percent. Uh, like we're gonna be punched in the face by the time we finish with John Netto for sure. That's right. The, <laughs> anyway, so let's uh, let's move on here. Uh, Kev, uh, give us a quick disclaimer. Okay, clients and employees of East West Investment Management may hold positions and securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. Side effects of too much market huddle may include bicycle face, werewolf syndrome, and or jumping Frenchman of Maine syndrome. Okay, you stop think for this a second. Is, yeah, I know. What, what, like, the, what the... Okay. I ha- I have to tell you about this. Jumping Frenchman of Maine is a form of, of exaggerated startle reflex known as hyper <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Now, the best part is this part. It's so named because it was first observed in French Canadian lumberjacks in the Moosehead Lake region of Maine in 1878. <laughs> Sufferers were reported to react to abnormally loud sudden noises, screaming, flailing, muscle seizures, <laughs> and most puzzlingly, obeying commands in a reflexive, involuntary manner. I don't, I'm not shitting you. This is like true. And I well, love the yeah, fact that and, it's... And listening to our show can cause this. This is crazy. I, that's you know right. what? Our, listen, our listeners are warned. Only the French Canadian lumberjack listeners, though. Everybody else is good. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> Let's move on. All right. So joining us here in the show is uh, John Netto. And uh, uh, John is the author of uh, The Global Macro Edge and uh, certainly a trader that loves to talk the Fed. So I think that that's what we're going to talk about. Welcome, John. It's great to be here, Patrick and Kevin. Thanks for having me, guys. No problem. So, so John, I want to start off. Like Next week, we have the Fed coming out, uh, the FOMC meeting, and uh, and now there's all this banter about interest rates and whether there's going to be a cut coming up soon. You love to trade these types of events. Uh, and so uh, let's start off with just uh, you telling us how you trade these events. How do you set this all up? What's your approach to, to trading an FOMC meeting like this? Sure. So I take a top-down approach to establishing where possible you know price and opportunities occur. And whether it's a Fed event or key tier one economic data or an election, if you get a regime shift or a period of potential price discovery, 
Um, it sets up for um, a trader like myself who's a little more nimble, and I imagine a lot of viewers out there as well, an opportunity to put on um, trades that offer great um, returns per unit of risk. So a common metric out there that people use to measure risk-adjusted returns would be like a sharp ratio. Well, I, I created something called a netto number. And so when I assess a strategy, I like to look at how a strategy, um, what the potential for that return per unit of risk is, or, or at, at a basic level, at a second um, dimensional level, what kind of risk-adjusted returns it can generate. Now, these events, to get to that, to why that's relevant, these events like the Fed or like Tier 1 data or like maybe a big election or a news outbreak, like maybe a, a tariff announcement, offer or can offer greater risk-adjusted return potential than other strategies. And so the, the goal is, is it, well, let me identify what is it about these events that cause that? How can I trade these events? How can I model these events? And so in particular, the Fed is one of those events that um, provides opportunity where we can get into asymmetrical risk reward ratio. So I can risk one to make three or four or 10 or 15, um, both from understanding the nuance of the event and through proper trade structure. And so that's sort of a top-down view of, of why I like one to identify regime shifts or big events, but more specifically, um, why I like to trade the Fed as well. So, so it's Kev here. Um, so John, I, I'm just dying to know what, how you're setting up for this next Fed meeting. It's uh, it, it's probably one of the better events out there in terms of there's never been the, this much kind of uncertainty in terms of how where the Fed's headed and what and what they will specifically do. So what are you looking for this next week? Sure. So I, I think to preface what you what you said is that when you look at why there's so much opportunity, why there's so much uncertainty, that's an indictment of this of this Powell Fed. If we go back to December and, and a little bit of history, I think is appropriate to set the stage for next week's meeting. If we go back to December, uh, there were many, no, there were enough. There, there was, there was a, a silent, there was, there were a contingent of people that were calling for the Fed to not hike in December. If we remember on, on December 19th, 2018, uh, a number of people or people did not want the Fed to hike and were concerned that they were not adjusting to what was quickly becoming or what was beginning to see some erosion in the data out there, concerns over China, the trade talks, all those things. Um, and, fed, and, and, and this was right after in October where, where Powell basically said that we're on autopilot. So when you look at what the Fed did in December, when they came out and they commented that there'd be a few more cuts, and then again during the Powell press conference in December, he gave a very um, hawkish impression. That led to a 600 basis point sell off in the S&P 500. Merely two and a half weeks later, Powell sat down, I believe, at the Economic Club on, on January 4th and actually talked about how patient he could be, aware of just what mistake had happened. He'd done a total about faith. Now fast forward to the January 30th meeting, and and those th that patient term, in essence, the, the meaning they would not hike, was memorialized in that January 30th or January 31st 31st statement. We now go to March, where the Fed dropped a number of the dot plots down, which again they became even more dovish. Which, if you follow the history of the Fed, the March meetings can be very dovish. There's a seasonality factor to that, and 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 on top of that, we have a uh, we have a uh, them, you know, commenting on on the mortgage-backed uh, securities as well, and then we, then we go to to May, um, and May they threw us a bone um, in terms of of just their assessment of the economy, and even during the press conference, Powell talked about inflation being transitory. That May first meeting that we had, as you recall, where he sat there. I mean, this was right two days before the Trump tweet on that Sunday night that really reactivated the trade wars again. So you've seen this oscillation. You've seen um, the Fed, which resembles really not much more than the rest of us. They are far more reactive to data than they are proactive in, in leading us. And so when you have a Fed that is as reactive as the Fed is, it creates opportunity of what are they going to say next? So now reflect that, Kevin and, uh, and Patrick, against this ecosystem of liquidity that exists in the market. If the Fed is changing their mind, and if as a result of them changing their mind or them providing um, new, fresh perspectives that the market wasn't ready for on, on a range of topics, then people have to restructure their portfolio. There's not enough liquidity in the market for people to, 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 meet, to instantaneously rebalance their portfolios or, or, or restructure their, how to, the composition of their portfolio. So that's where it gives me and other traders out there who have a model to score these events and identify what components are a part of that to take advantage of that, given the, the vehicle of electronic trading. So, John, it's Patrick here. So the question I have for you, 
you've obviously been uh, watching and modeling many of these past meetings. Uh, for, compared right. to uh, the, the past few um, uh, Fed meetings, how important do you think that this one here in June is on a, on a relative basis to some of the past ones? Is this, is it, this one potentially have a big surprise factor? I think so, and thank you for for not letting me off the hook there because I got a little embedded in my in my process and then answered the original part of that first question. So thank you for bringing me really back in. Um, I need some of that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think there is a a deal for surprise because what, what effectively what we've had is that the market has you know if you look at the Fed funds futures, look at euro dollar curve, has looked at you know that there will be three cuts this year coming into you know, coming into today Friday, um, you know yeah. June fourteenth, and I think that that's a bit optimistic. And so when you have the potential of, of one, you know, where financial conditions have gone, what the, what the yield curve has done, the state of economic data out there, we did have some strong retail sales this morning, which, which definitely caught people off guard. To me, how the Fed is going to toe that line between not panicking, all right, because the, the world market's slowing down, but what guys will they do that in? I believe that this meeting and where they're going to toe that line will be how they use um, not reaching their inflation targets as, as the way to make that happen. So I'm going to be looking for specifically, how does the Fed address inflation? Are inflation pressures muted? Is it more structural? Powell used the word transitory in his May 1st press conference to describe um, the lower inflation rates right now. Well, that's kind of problematic because, I don't know, the CPI this week, the payroll number last week with average hourly earnings, um, you know, he even referenced to, to, to indicate why it was transient, the Dallas trimmed mean, which is like, a lot of us are like, huh? <laughs> Since when? You know, so, so the Fed has a way of justifying their opinions. They can find the numbers to do it. So it'll be interesting this week, how, or next week, how Powell addresses the inflation factor. And I think he'll do it in a way that says, listen, because of inflation, we may need to do a, a sort of maintenance cut. All right. And that's yeah. something that we are prepared to do and stand by. And I think under that guy, he's going to not let the market get too euphoric. On the other hand, he's not going to um, let people think that, you know, that, that the economy is crashing either. That he'll, he'll couch these interest rate cuts as more in line with maintenance because it is more of an inflation issue, not because of a trade issue. Because we all know the trade concerns can dissipate. You know, we have a G20 meeting coming up. All right. Yeah. How is Powell going to commit to one thing? Then the G20 comes a week later. And he's a fool again because, oh, my gosh, you're going to cut. You're going to cut two times now. And we have a trade deal. And all of a sudden, you know, employment to 3.6%, unemployment 3.6%. What's the Fed doing? They're getting whipped around. Yeah. So, right. John. But the, I, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, Patrick. No. I was going to no. just say, um, so I agree with your, your analysis that he's in a very t tough spot in terms of how to stick handle what the market is expecting versus what he wants to do. And you mentioned the fact that there's three cuts priced into there and the fact that uh, that's what the market is expecting. I, I personally don't see how he's going to give the market all the dovish kind of uh, soothing words that they're looking for. And that this is, is setting up for something that is a kind of sell the news on the kind of fixed income side, especially on the short term side or the short short end of the curve. What is your thoughts there? Like, how do you like how would you set up a specific trade going into this Fed um, announcement? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. Um, one is you can look at the curve itself, all right? If, if, first of all, regardless of what he does, there should be sufficient time for us to react. And that's part of my process is that while I don't take particularly large positions going into the event, sometimes I do. There are structures that exist and opportunities out there. I oftentimes just wait after and use my proprietary scoring process and modeling to grade the event and then – you know, refract that through, all right, you know, was Pal able or was Pal able to toe the line? Was he able to like both satisfy doves and hawks? So the answer is no. Well, then you can sell risk. All right. Um, you, you can, you, you can maybe buy the dollar, sell the Euro, um, you know, look at what gold is doing. Um, maybe attack certain parts of, you know, the, the, the se sector baskets, which would re represent that. Um, you know, one thing in particular that also goes into that, which is a great question is, well, how would I play that? We're on a 24 hour news cycle. So, like, look at this morning. Trump is making, you know, Trump is talking this morning about trade stuff. But given the perspective of things, how we approach that cycle dictates even come next Wednesday for this meeting what you want to do. Have Treasury has, has maybe euro dollars sell off, and, and you know, in the two days leading up to that, that would be a little bit different than if we're going in at highs. So 
to what degree the positions are there kind of plays a factor there. Let's get specific though, because that's what I just talked about. It's a little bit abstract. All right. Um, for me, no, no, but actually, can, one second, can, yeah. before you go specific, can I just jump in there? Because I think that's a great please, point. Please. So um, yeah. you're arguing that what you'll do instead of betting in front of the number, you'll get the number or the event. You'll sure, look at the sure. event and, and, and that sure. process of the market uh, discounting that in, new information from the event isn't instantaneous. And I no, guess it's more, inst- yeah. right? And and I, if I if maybe I, if I understand you correctly, it's might be instantaneous in Treasury, I mean Euro dollar futures or the short end of the curve, they, because that's a little bit of math. It's probably easier to do. But then the process of, of of adjusting your portfolio based upon the Fed's new language or direction is takes a, a longer period. And and does that period take? you know, hours, you know, days, weeks, like how long are you playing after an event like the Fed's uh, announcement? Great question. So that can be anywhere from one minute. I, I built proprietary software that processes and goes through the statement and synthesizes that information. So I do all the work beforehand. So this is like a six or seven day period, even now that I'm building these models out that are going to go in and synthesize information. So to your point, I'd say, okay, um, let's, you know, we'll process this. This can take one minute, depending, also depending the enormity of the surprise. If it's only a modest surprise, you may not get that big of a reaction depending on market positioning going in. If it's a big surprise, let's say December, for example, when, when, when Powell, you know, gave no inclination, you know, back to December 2018, that, that, that they were done hiking, you saw people caught off guard by that. People were, were hoping, anticipating, expecting, whatever the word is, that he would sound a little more dovish and he would be a little more open that things may be changing, that the, 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 the winds may be shifting. He wasn't. The S&P sold off 600 basis points over the following three days. Conversely, in, on following the January meeting and, and the March meeting, we had you know sufficient rallies following those meetings in, in risk. And so when there are sea changes, this stuff takes time um, to, to process. So to your point, could be a day, could be a minute, could be an hour. Um, but again, if you want to find the risk of war trades that pay you really well, being in the first five to 15 to 30 minutes, um, following this new piece of information is ideally the best time to do it. And having tools that can help synthesize that information is what I've spent a lot of time and a lot of resources to create. Right. Okay. But often after a Fed meeting, the S and P gyrates around like you, you get this and it, and it ends up being uh, you know, you have to have a a very good stomach to, to weather the ups and downs because you get big moves. So are you often fading that move and like, or you don't, you, Sometimes you're going with it. Sometimes you're fading it and it doesn't really matter. And then you're taking it off kind of the next day when, when the market settles down and figures it out. Is that kind of a typical reaction? God, I love your question. I love your question, man. This is like, the, thanks for teeing this up. Um, Cause I, I forgot to mention this. Um, I think that's the hardest part of trading the Fed. And the reason why it's hard is that people don't have the tools to synthesize the information. Know that that big spike, should I be buying that big spike and going with the trade? Or should I be fading that big spike because it's, it's inconsequential information that's just, that's just come out? And what I've done is create software that by going through my model, my four-part model, that quickly synthesizes literally in less than one second that goes in and answers all these questions. I say, listen, what does the statement say about rates? That's the first part of the model, the passive rate hikes. What does the statement say about you know, the assessment of the economy? What does the statement say about specifically inflation? And then are there any idiosyncratic variables that are in that? It aggregates all of those. I built out multiple contingency plans, all right? And based on the assessment of those four inputs in my model, I then say, okay, there's a spike here, but there was no material news about any of those four components. So what can I do with this spike? I can fade it. Oh my goodness. They talked about um, that they were still, in December, they're still gonna hike. Um, They're still bullish on the economy. They're still good. So there there appears to be no inclination at all that they're gonna shift their tone. It's time to sell the S&P 500, okay? And knowing which parts of the paragraph to look at, knowing which things the markets are keyed on, because there's a, a very idiosyncratic aspect to this, to where what the market focused on in this Fed meeting or on this election or on this Brexit news is different than it was six months, nine months, 18 months ago. So that nuance is very hard to quantitatively model if you don't have the qualitative um, understanding and holistic understanding of, of what is specifically setting up and then how the markets themselves um, have been behaving um, um, leading up to the event. All right. Uh, so, John, I, I want to take this a little bit bigger picture 
Uh, because sure. uh, out in Chicago last week, uh, I think, it, uh, it, well, nothing, but there was, a, a, the, in the language of the Fed, uh, they basically redefined what they typically would have called the zero lower bound of interest rates right. now, and they changed the right. language to the effective lower bound, opening the window to potentially, uh, at least some people are implying that it's leading to potentially the idea of negative interest rates. And I thought sure. this was fascinating. So and now obviously we were just talking about how to trade the Fed n number itself. But when we're talking bigger picture here, do you think that that was uh, really important? Where do you, what do you think this means in, in, in your perspective? I think when it comes to understanding the Fed and specifically with this, with this mention is that the Fed likes to float ideas you're talking about the Fed has the most economists of any organization in the world, uh, more, more economic PhDs than any organization in the world. These ideas, you know, um, are, are out there. Uh, I don't think that, and maybe I'm, I'm you know, misinterpreting this, but I don't think zero interest rates or negative interest rates, a little ZERP policy for the, for the U.S. Is, is anytime soon. But I think, and again, and, and just think about that, okay? If I was to say to you, I believe we're going to have negative rates, well, if you were to get long Fed funds futures, you're getting long the euro dollar curve last week, you'd be okay right now, but at a practical level, all right, what are you going to do? Buy two-year treasuries from here? And when you look at them on a the chart, because we're already factoring the 75 basis points of cuts this year. Yeah. So it's important to separate and distinguish these theoretical academic-esque type of mentions versus what's eminently practical. And the Fed, I'll give them this, um, maybe not Powell per se, but the Fed at least postures or at least holds themselves that they try not to become like week to week day traders, if you will, and that things happen gradually. I mean, just look at the balance of risk statements on their statement. You know, they were roughly balanced for a year and a half or two years, despite, you know, many of us thinking at one point in time that, that the balance of risk should be shifted to the upside. Conversely, I would say now that maybe those balance of risk should be shifted to the downside. Okay. So now that was removed altogether, but there are aspects of the Fed statement and the Fed messaging. It could, be, it could become very inert. And so academic aspects like that, whether it's, you know, discussing that or discussing, I mean, you know, the Fed puts out also like um, every five years an assessment of income inequality, 2013, that very famous piece on income inequality. So they do have these broader academic themes. Um, how relevant or more importantly, monetizable those themes are to us or even for the more majority portfolio managers um, is a much more tenuous endeavor. All right. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to yeah. jump in here because I, I think that you're echoing what David Rosenberg talked about last year when I can't remember if it was the San Francisco Fed or the St. Louis Fed, but somebody introduced a paper that went through the last um, kind of recession, the Great Recession, and talked about the fact that had we gone to negative rates, how much this would have helped the economy. And this was a dramatic shifting in terms of the Fed's policy. And Rosenberg kept saying, to, you know, highlighting this, saying that the Fed is getting us ready for negative rates. And that's the first step that they do is they introduce a paper and they sure. put it into their kind of minutes and stuff. So I think you're, you're bang on correct and, and uh, echoing very much what Rosenberg is talking about. I personally think it's a disastrous policy and that negative rates are obviously, you know, a terrible road to go down and how the Fed is convincing itself that this is, a, is, is something that we should be doing is, is mind boggling stupid. And we, all we have to do is look at Europe to know that this is, is ridiculous but you know we're traders and we have to trade what's in front of us instead of what we want it to be um so i agree with you completely and uh do you have any thoughts about you know europe and 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 negative rates in general like their effectiveness not so much insofar as okay listen there are two th there are two skill sets out there all right when it comes to doing what we do there's the analytical skill set which you're going to construct and put together great things and then there's the skill of making money, all right? And making money is a unique skill all into itself. It requires, obviously, the ability to analyze and construct trades, but more important, how to execute those trades and identify on a return, on a cost-benefit analysis, where will I get my biggest bang for the buck? It does mean more good as an event trader to analyze Draghi's inclinations during press conferences, okay, and to identify bull movements, all right, then to do a more protracted study because the risk profile of trying to say, okay, I think negative rates are effectively going to cause booms or bo my, my boom model says that because of negative rates and because of this structure that 
Boone should be trading at minus 40 basis points in the next year. And they're at minus 10 right now. Okay, let me put on this position for 12 months. Well, the risk profile of that, Kevin, is not as good as the ability to be caught in or involved in a repricing of the market where liquidity affords you an opportunity to, re- to achieve above average risk adjusted returns. And so for me, those kind of questions are interesting from a table perspective and provide a more broader narrative because they can distill down to a one or two day event that maybe if that gets mentioned by Draghi, like, oh, we, we like zero interest rates or reserve policy, blah, blah, blah. Well, then that can cause a 20 or 30 pip spike in the euro. Maybe that's worth scalping because you have that context. But in terms of larger portfolio construction and finding great risk adjusted trades, it's not as conducive. John, right. that is like so one second. I just want to say one thing, Patrick. I love this guy. He uh, he doesn't want to sit around and argue about what should be or what you know what policies. You I don't know, care. Um, I don't care exactly. No. I think that is such a great way. On Twitter, I see so many people sitting around arguing how the world should be instead of worrying about what the next trade is. And I think that is such a refreshing and terrific answer. I you know I wish I had given it. All right. Well, I want to leave John with one last question. All right. So uh, we, we've been messing around with this recent video from Trump uh, was, was suggesting that uh, if he had someone else in place at the Fed, uh, they wouldn't have raised interest rates as much as they did. And he's kind of basically uh, throwing Powell under the bus, saying that they've tightened too much and that the stock market would have uh, should have been much higher and that they shouldn't have been draining the liquidity. Uh, what's your take? Did uh, did Powell overshoot? Is is Trump onto something, or is just Ch- or Trump just being Trump? There's two components of this. Um, I think we can't answer that question unless we really hearken on Fed independence. And there's no reason because December was a disaster. The hike in December was a mistake. That's beyond a doubt. The fact that the Fed's now looking to to cut 75 basis points this year is kind of all you need to know. Not all you need to know, but but it's definitely suggested that that hike was a mistake, and that Trump objectively is correct in his frustrations about that. However, if we understand what preceded that Fed event, if we understand that the, the president effectively through Twitter and through his channels demand that the Fed not hike, that the Fed be, end quantitative tightening and put the pressure and, and ultimately create an optic situation where the Fed's independence is questioned, I'm not as critical of what the Fed did in December because that could have been back channeled and they could have collaborated together to have avoided that. But that wasn't a process that either the White House or the Fed you know, could effectively put together. So speaking objectively, with the benefit of hindsight, but also at the time, I was in the camp that said the Fed should not hike, although you know, it was like 90% price in or 90% chance of them hiking at that meeting. They should not have hiked. They should have rolled back QT, given what was setting up, and simply couched it as a pause, and that's something that they could, have, could resume later. That's not what happened. They plowed through. They hiked. We saw what happened in the markets. He suggested not only did they hike, they kept. They suggested that further hikes were coming. Okay, so yeah. I think that was, in other words, had Powell couched that listen, we're going to hike this last time and we're done. I don't think the market sells off 600 basis points in December like it did that sharp sell off, because effectively the market's a forward pricing mechanism. That didn't happen. The president's to blame for putting pressure and questioning the independence of the Fed and creating bad optics. And the Fed's to blame because they improperly back channel with the White House to make this happen. All right. Well, John, uh, listen, we got, I want to move on here because our listeners may uh, are not aware of this yet. And we, we, are, we wanted to use this uh, podcast or and this uh, show to actually announce it. But uh, you get the uh, privilege of uh, moderating a, uh, a smackdown between Kevin Muir and myself at the uh, Traders Expo. Uh, and so uh, just for our listeners information, so uh, John is actually running at the uh, Chicago Traders Expo, which was running July 21st. Actually, the whole series is on July 21st, but the, the show is 21st to the 23rd of July. But you do a series called the Global Macro Edge Series, right? And so there's a series of, of macro sessions and one of them you're going to moderate – Kevin Muir and myself going into a session, which is we're calling the bull versus bear smackdown, where our stocks and bonds heading. And uh, well, uh, I, you know, I don't know whether you would be looking forward to watching this gong show of, of Kevin and me going at it, uh, but it's going to be a fun time, isn't it? 
we're going to crush it, guys. The three of us are going to be out of control. <laughs> and and, so, and what I love about this is that – yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to ask you, tell us a little bit about this Global Macro Edge series and, uh, and what uh, people should expect if they come and join us for that event. Absolutely. So the Global Macro Edge series um, is, is, is a spinoff from uh, the book that I wrote with, with 14 other contributing authors, the Global Macro Edge. And the, the, the ethos of our event is that there's never been more information available to a more diverse group of people than right now. And I think that the, your show, your podcast is emblematic of that, that anyone who wants to empower themselves with information can find the vehicle, can find the channel to make that happen. And so the speakers of part of this really believe that to whom much is given, much is expected. So we put this event on for free. Um, it takes the concepts of the global macro edge, which is applying a fundamental narrative on top of, you know, strategies to, to trade the markets and, and assess things on a return per unit of risk basis. And I'm just thrilled that, that you guys are going to be a part of that. And, and, and we want to, you know, we want to create and put forth stimulating, engaging dialogue. So we structure this much like a, a 20 minute breakout session followed by a five or 10 minute Q and A. And this goes on two or three times a year. We just had one in New York in March. We're doing it obviously July 21st, which uh, you guys will be a part of. And, and I think that, you know, we'll crush it, and, and, and it's a no-holds-barred event, and, and a lot of tough questions, <laughs> a lot of introspection, and and, and I'm going to hold you guys to a high standard BMC as, as your moderator. Well, you know what? Uh, Kev's going down. That's all I have to say. It's a cage match. I still like, uh, Patrick, that you said the privilege. Sean has the privilege of moderating it. <laughs> It's pretty arrogant of you. That's all I can say. Bad fortune of doing it. Somehow he didn't know what yeah. he didn't know what he was getting into when he when he signed up for that. I just want to take a second to say the Global Macro Edge, uh, your book, John. I have it. It's a terrific book. I, I I've had it long before I met you. Um, when the young people come to me and say I'm interested in global macro, what should I where should I start? It's one of those books that I that I put people on right up there with Market Wizards. I think it's a terrific book, and uh, we'll make sure we include a link on our. Uh, the email that we send out to everyone because I think it's uh, an indispensable, very uh, practical. And then that's the one thing I would say about it is very practical. It's not, and, and it's obvious speaking to you that you're a practical guy that is more interested in kind of trading and figuring out good risk reward setups than talking about what should be, or, you know, whether there's going to be some grandiose change in the dollar status or the federal reserve is going to lose all of its credibility you're interested in where's the next trade how can i make some money doing this and i think it's a great refreshing attitude all right well listen Thank you guys. i, I want to oh no john i just want to uh, do one quick uh, a shout out we, what we did back in march in toronto is we did a market huddle meetup uh, where we met up at a bar and we invited all of our listeners to come join us. And uh, Kevin and I have uh, decided that while, while when in Chicago, we have to have another market huddle meetup. So any of our listeners that make it out to the uh, Chicago Traders Expo on July 21st, um, we, uh, after our little smackdown, later that evening, we haven't decided whether it's at 7 or 8, we're going to uh, make the announcement later on, we're going to have a market huddle meet up with our listeners. We're going to announce with the bar we're going to hang out. And, and John, will you be able to uh, join us that evening and, uh, and, and meet many of our listeners? I will join it, but caveat emptor to anyone who attends. This is the sort of, you know, um, after, after you see us, you know, together on stage, you know, I mean, you're not protected by the podcast anymore. You'll be close enough <laughs> incarnate, right? But you got to be careful. In terms of what what could what could evolve, because this is alcohol free right now. All right, I, I, so just be careful. <laughs> well, actually, it's if not. You do but that's. <laughs> John, John um, it's, it's, it might be alcohol free on your side, but uh, we kind of <laughs> cheat behind the scenes. <laughs> so uh, no and, and all I can say, Vegas, everyone, ten oh eight in the morning is just fine. You know, there's no last call in yeah. Vegas. <laughs> That's right. Um, the one thing I will say for I'm looking forward to meeting our market huddlers from Chicago. And I think, Patrick, you should all buy him a sour, the nastiest, ugliest sour, since he's always making me drink them. Make sure you buy him one of those because oh. let's see him drink all these terrible beers. Figure out the worst sour you can buy. Um, <laughs> unless you're a millennial, at which point you probably like a sour. Bring your best sour and give, make Patrick drink it. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, John, uh, just uh, uh, we're going to have a jo have you join us in the after hours show here. But but um, just uh, right now, if you can just let everyone know where they can find you, where they can follow your stuff, please uh, just give everyone a quick plug on uh, about you. Sure. Find me on Twitter at, at John Meadow, at J-O-H-N, and as Nancy, E-T-T-O, and everything on my Twitter profile. And uh, it's been an honor to be here today, guys. It's, it's an immense pleasure, and I look forward to crushing it in Chicago with you. All right. Well, John, uh, uh, we look forward to uh, uh, Chicago as well. And listen, uh, stick around, and we'll uh, have you in our after hours, and we'll continue this conversation. Thanks. Absolutely, guys. Thank you. So, Patrick, often I do the trading tales, but in a little reversal of uh, roles this week, you're doing the tales from the trading desk. So what do you have for us? Right. And uh, not only am I doing the tales, but you're going to do this week in trading history. So we flip this around a little bit. But it, the irony our listeners will find at the end of it is that mine is a little more history and yours. Is, <laughs> anyway, uh, but... I wanted to go back to one of my favorite books, and I know a number of our uh, listeners also share in the love of this book, but we're going to Reminiscences of a Stock Operator with uh, Jesse Livermore. And, yeah, well, one uh, second, uh, just for everyone to know, this is an audio book because we all know Patrick can't read. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it is a really good audio book. Okay. So, but I, I wanted to go to the segment, uh, inside the book, which, uh, which, uh, Jesse is talking about, uh, him putting on a big coffee short during world war one. And, uh, I, well, I let's, let me just uh, quickly, uh, grab some of these excerpts and, and discuss some of the points from the book and, and then we could talk about it. So it goes, after the Great War broke out in Europe, uh, there began the rise in the prices of commodities that was to be expected. It was as easy to foresee as uh, foresee war inflation. Uh, why, when I first began to consider its speculative possibilities, coffee was actually selling below the pre-war prices. It didn't require Sherlock Holmes to size up the situation. Why everybody didn't uh, go and buy coffee, I cannot tell you. When I decided to buy it, I didn't consider it a speculation. It was more of an investment. So I started my buying operations in the winter of 1917, uh, and it took a, uh, I took on a quite a bit of coffee. The market, however, did not did nothing to speak of. It continued to be inactive, and as for the price, it didn't go up as I expected. Uh, the outcome of it all was that I simply carried my line to no purpose for nine long months. So my contracts expired, and I sold out all of my options. I took a whooping big loss on that deal, and yet I was sure my views were sound. I had been clearly wrong in the matter of time, but I was confident that coffee must advance as all commodities have done. So uh, that no sooner had I sold out my line than I started uh, in buying again. I bought this time three times as much coffee as I had so unprofitably carried during those nine disappointing months. Of course, I bought deferred options so, uh, for as long as I could get. Uh, I was not... Uh, so wrong now. As soon as I had taken on my troubled line, the market began to go up. People everywhere seemed to realize all of the sudden what uh, was bound to happen in the coffee market. It began to look as though my investment was going to turn me a mighty good rate of interest. So the sellers of the contracts I held were roasters, mostly of German names and affiliations, who had bought the coffee in Brazil, confidently expecting to bring it to this country. Uh, but there were no ships to bring it in. And presently, they found themselves in the uncomfortable situation of having no end of coffee down there and being heavily short of it up here to me. Uh, the punishment for being wrong is to lose money. The reward for being right is to make money. Being clearly right and carrying a big line, I was justified in expecting to make a killing. The reason I bought options so freely was because I didn't see how I could lose. <laughs> right? Conditions were in my favor. I had been made to wait a year, but now I was going to be paid both for my waiting and for being right. I could see the profit coming fast. There wasn't uh, any cleverness about it. It was, simply, uh, it was simply I wasn't blind. 
coming sure and fast, the profit of millions, but it had never reached me. No, it wasn't sidetracked by a sudden change in conditions. The market did not ex uh, experience an abrupt reversal of form. Coffee did not pour into the country. So what happened? The unexpectable. What had never happened in anybody's experience, and therefore I, ha I had no reason to guard against. Uh, I added a new one to the long list of hazards of speculation that I must always keep before me. It was simply that the fellows who had sold me the coffee, the shorts, knew what was in store for them, and in their effort to squirm out of the position uh, into which they had sold themselves, devised a new way of welshing. They rushed to Washington for help and got it. Perhaps you remember that the government had evolved various plans for preventing further profiteering uh, in necessities. Uh, you know how most of them worked. Well, the philanthropic coffee shorts appeared before the price fixing committee of the War Industries Board. I think uh, that was the official designation and made a patriotic appeal to that body to protect the American breakfaster. They asserted that the, this professional speculator, one Lawrence Livermore, uh, had cornered um, or was about to corner coffee. And if his speculative plans were not brought uh, to naught, uh, he would uh, take advantage of the conditions created by the war and the American people would be forced to pay exorbitant prices for their daily coffee. Uh, so fast forwarding to his postmortem goes, postmortems in speculation are a waste of time. They get you nowhere. But this particular deal had a certain educational value. It was uh, uh, as pretty as I've ever um, went into. The rise was so sure, so logical that I figured that I simply couldn't help but making several millions of dollars. But I didn't. On two other occasions, I'd suffered from the actions of exchange committees making rulings that changed trading rules without warning. But in those cases, my own position, uh, while technically right, was not quite so sound uh, commercially as my coffee trade. You cannot be dead sure of anything in the speculative operation. Uh, it is... The, uh, it was this experience I have just told you that made me add the unexpectable to the unexpected in my list of hazards. Nice. I like that last line. Right. So, uh, and the I thought it was unexpected of the yeah, unexpected. But, like but it does go to, you know, in trading, we do this all the time, right? Where we, uh, we basically come up with a narrative and no matter what, we data mine almost like almost, we look for all the evidence of everything that confirms that we're going to be dead right. But there's that old adage, it's what you don't know, you don't know, that always gets you. For sure. And I always laugh and say on my line, my tagline is all I bring to the party is 25 years of mistakes. And I always say, that, even though oh, you've been trading for 30, I always ask you what happened to the other five years. <laughs> no, I just haven't updated it. It's not as, it's not as good as 30 doesn't sound as good. Like it's 29 and a half. Like I'm not going to be like, but yeah, uh, but five years is a big difference. Like, okay, I mean, you, so you clearly haven't made any mistakes in the last five. <laughs> oh, that's what you're trying to imply. That's actually funny. <laughs> I like that. That's, <laughs> nope. I am, I'm pretty sure I've made lots of mistakes in the last five. And, and one of the things that I liked about it is he, is he said something to the effect that he realized that this is a new way they got to screw you. Like another way he could find that, uh, that he lost money in an unexpected way. And, and I can just, like, I think he's so right. And he's on to something when he talks about that, because it's not what you like. It's not, you're never kind of predict how you're going to get screwed and you always have to be on the lookout for it because it can come from the strangest places. Yeah. And this is, this is why actually why I love hedging with options because, um, even though you don't like burning theta and, and you don't like, uh, the idea of buying premium with an option comes a certain degree of certainty. 
uh, where your risk is definitively limited to what you outlaid for those options, right? Right. And and when you're in the futures market and you and you're saying I'm going to manage out of my position when it goes against me, and so uh, when when il- uh, when a liquid market becomes illiquid, it's always shocking how fast it moves and how much slippage can occur in, in under certain conditions, right? But anyway, I I <laughs> thought uh, I thought his coffee uh, trade was a great lesson. And it's a great tale of how uh, you can, uh, when, you, when you're big enough, when you're a whale trader like Jesse Livermore used to be, uh, yeah. that, uh, that you have a lot political considerations uh, to, that it has to be uh, uh, taken into consideration, right? Well, yeah. And thanks for that tale, Patrick. It's great. And thank you for proving that you actually can read. <laughs> I barely read it well. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Listen, so this week in trading history, I've been handling these for a little while, but because uh, well, you love the trading history and you do a terrific job, um, but something came up and I thought to myself, I got to grab this week's trading history one, and uh, and you reluctantly let me have it, so I gave you the trading tale, and uh, so let's get to it. Um, this week, thirty six years ago, Trading Places the movie premiered. And for those who haven't seen the movie and are like the trading, you have to go watch it. It's a classic. It's up there. You know, it's probably better than Wall Street. It's probably better than almost anything else. It's if you're going to work on a trading desk and you haven't seen trading places, you you're, you know you're going to be you're going to miss a lot of the jokes. So let's just uh, let's play. Well, the, the, uh, the, the, first of all, the one the one most important one is is the Duke and Duke. The Duke and Duke, yes, you're going to actually have trouble understanding some of our bets and and some of our references if you haven't watched it. So let's let's go through and let's just play the uh, the trailer. Dan Aykroyd. This man is physically threatening me. And Eddie Murphy. Ah! Oh, man! What the? Ah! Are trading places. Find out. I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. This is been a great, great mistake. It looks just like the dude that had me busted. It was the jokes. It was the jokes. You're a dead man, Valentine. Dan Aykroyd. Eddie Murphy. Billy Ray Valentine. Capricorn. Trading Places. Coming this summer to a theater or drive-in near you. Now... Sell 200 April 142! All right, Kev, I, I just have to comment. Back then, this movie is so old that they actually had to insert go to your local movie theater and or drive through. I know. Like, uh, uh, ha- half of our millennials don't even know what a drive through is. That's right. Or dr- drive in. Sorry, I said drive through. Dri- yeah. Drive in is like, but uh, what a classic movie. Yeah. So now I went and did some digging because I figured that I just can't uh, highlight the movie and we should find a little bit of the history of this. So a couple of things. First of all, it was originally supposed to star Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder, and it was supposed to be titled Black and White. Okay. But then uh, Richard Pryor unfortunately set himself on fire. (laughs) That was a little bit. What do you mean? Go go Google that. If you don't know that story, just go Google it. You'll, You'll figure it out. He, uh, was experimenting with some drug use and had to, had an unfortunate tr- uh, turn of events. Uh, let's go through some other things here uh, that are so funny because I see that um, Gordon Liddy almost agreed to play Clarence Beeks, and that would have been really sad because then Paul Gleason, who is the guy from Breakfast Club, who ended up being the guy in the gorilla costume, I think that would have been like it, the role was made for him. And I just, I think that that was something that would have, if that would happen, it would have just not been the same that uh, Paul Gleason was an important part of that movie. But here's right. where it re- gets really uh, kind of interesting um, is that there was some great cameos that people might not realize. First of all, Bo Diddley played a pawnbroker. Jim Belushi came and was in the gorilla costume, you know, where is Beaks? That was actually Jim Belushi in there. And then the best part that I like is Al Franken and Tom Davis played baggage handlers. And so you know how Al Franken was a senator until he got himself into trouble? He was still getting royalties for that in 2012. (laughs) 
Isn't that hilarious? Now, the best part, yeah. you're going to appreciate this. In 2010, when they went and were putting in, into effect the Dodd-Frank rule, they put in a, a kind of a provision in there called the, the Eddie Murphy rule. You know what the Eddie Murphy rule is? Please tell me what the Eddie Mur- <laughs> Murphy rule is. It was, until this point, it was actually not illegal to use misappropriated government information for in the commodity markets. So it wasn't wow. illegal what Duke and Duke did. And I remember this, actually, because I remember Goldman Sachs getting in some trouble for, um, uh, well, I think it was an auction on the, on the Treasury bonds. It was some news. And there was some question about whether it was technically illegal to use that information that they had realized ahead of time. So it's, it, it's, uh, who would have thought that there was an Eddie Murphy rule? I had no idea. I, you, you know, I learned something new in uh, this week's trading history. Yeah, well, that's, no, yeah, this is that's that's what this this week's trading history is all about, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, well, listen. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. And I'll tell you one last story. So, I have a son. He's uh, he's early teenagers, and I was driving the other day with uh, with him and his friend, and his friend was talking to me about classic movies and how he loves the movies from the eighties. And he said he asked me, "Have you ever seen this movie Trading Places?" And I was like, "Dude, have I ever seen a movie Trading Places? How many times have I seen Trading Places?" And yeah. it was great to see the younger generation grabbing hold and loving this movie. He thought it was awesome. I encourage all of our younger listeners to go watch it. It's one of the best movies out there in terms of trading. And just so you know, when Patrick and I do a Duke and out Duke one dollar bet, what we're talking about. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's move on. That's uh, awesome. Thanks. All right, uh, Kev. It's time for. The WTF clip of the week, and, and and now you did compile this, and and actually did a great job. But I, I I was actually begging you to put this one together for several weeks. That's right. Like you've I, been you've been bugging me for this one particular clip to be included in somehow well, work. I basically. Well, if I can give it some context, because okay, you did a great ahead. job on this, and I'm, we're going to share it in a moment. But, but uh, I, uh, uh, you know what? Actually, no, no. Let's talk about it after. Let's play it first. Okay. We have great numbers. The companies are very strong. They're very liquid. This is the Honey Badger. Watch it run in slow motion. It's pretty badass. Look, it runs all over the place. And frankly, if we had a different person in the Federal Reserve that wouldn't have raised interest rates so much, we would have been at least a point and a half higher. Whoa, watch out, says that bird. Ew, it's got a snake. Oh, it's chasing a jackal. Oh my gosh. Oh, the Honey Badgers are just crazy. He's your three, pick. 3.2 is good. He's my pick. I agree. But, you know, we also have people in there that weren't my pick. But he's my pick, and uh, I disagree with him entirely. As you know, it's independent. The honey badger has been referred to by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most fearless animal in all of the animal kingdom. It really doesn't give a shit. If it's hungry, it's hungry. Ew, what's that in its mouth? Oh, it's got a cobra? Oh, it runs backwards? Now watch this. Look, a snake's up in the tree. Honey badger don't care. Honey... I was going to ask you about that. What do you make of the critics who say it's just inappropriate for you to be talking about the Well, I'm allowed to. And, you know, in the old days, they used to speak to the head of the Federal Reserve often. And it was a part, very much a part of the administration from the standpoint is that talk and that that really settle. You have no idea how important it is. Bad, you don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. Whenever it's hungry, it just, ew, and it eats snakes. Oh, my God, watch it dig. Look at that digging. The honey badger is really pretty badass. They have no regard for any other animal whatsoever. But I'm not happy with what he's done. I'm not happy with the fact that they've done quantitative tightening. Look, and it's just grunting and, ew, eating snakes. Ew, what's that, a mouse? Oh, that's nasty. Oh, they're so nasty. Ooh, look, it's chasing things and eating them. The honey badgers have a fairly long body, but a distinctly thick set, broad shoulders, and, you know, their, their skin is loose allowing them to move about freely. Now, he doesn't make that decision himself, but I would think that the head of the Federal Reserve has quite a bit of power. No, I'm not happy. Now, now look, here's a house full of bees. You think the honey badger cares? It doesn't give a shit. It goes right into the house of bees to get some larva. How disgusting is that? It eats larva. Ew, that's so nasty. Do if, if you have we, any concern you're putting him in a box? Let, let me explain. Yes, I do, but I'm going to do it anyway because uh, I've waited long enough. But look, the honey badger doesn't care. It's getting stung like a thousand times. It doesn't give a shit. It just, it's hungry. It doesn't care about being stung by bees. 
Nothing can stop the honey badger when it's hungry. If he did the interest rate increases half as much. If he didn't do tightening, tightening means taking money out of the out of the till. Oh, what a crazy fuck. Look. Ew, it's eating larva. That's disgusting. There it is. So that people can't use it for doing what they're doing. We call it quantitative tightening. If he didn't do tightening, if he did nothing or perhaps even loosened, we would be, in my opinion, just an opinion, 10,000 points higher than already a very high number. You know, we At nighttime, the honey badger goes hunting because it's hungry. Look, here comes a fierce battle between a king cobra and a honey badger. I wonder what'll happen. Look at this. There's the honey badger just eating a mouse. And then look, get away from me, says the snake. Get away from me. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger. From the time I got elected, we're about, we're almost 50% up of the stock market. But if he didn't do the tightening and if he didn't do so much of an increase, it's okay to raise interest rates a little bit, but so much, it would have been, it would have been even better. But your honey badger smacks the shit out of it. And the snake comes back and it lashes right at the honey badger. Oh, little does the honey badger know, FYI, it's been stung. And I'll, and I'll tell you something, what I don't like is when you raise the interest rates, there's no inflation, there's virtually no inflation. It's been bitten by the snake, so while it's eating the snake, ew, that's disgusting. Meanwhile, the poisonous venom is seeping through the honey badger's body, and it passes out. Look at that sleepy fuck. When you raise interest rates, that means you're paying more in debt, and I inherited almost 21 trillion dollars in debt. I inherited that. Now the honey badger is just going to pass out for a few minutes and then it's going to get right back up and start eating all over again because it's a hungry little bastard. Look, President Obama and Biden, they doubled the debt during their eight years. You know that. And it's been going I inherited on your, on your Sure, too. but I have to rebuild the military. They doubled the debt and they didn't do anything. Look at this. Like nothing happened. The honey badger gets right back up and continues eating the cobra. How disgusting. And of course, what does the honey badger have to eat for the next three weeks? Cobra, the honey badger. <laughs> the honey badger just don't give a shit. That's yeah, but right. so, it's so, a good video. For those who haven't watched it, go watch it in its entirety. I was looking it up. It has 91 million views, Patrick. And, uh, honey, and probably uh, probably 10% of them are me just hitting <laughs> replay. Because... Uh, <laughs> I just can't stop laughing. You know, it's a classic when no matter how many times you see it, you laugh every time, right? Like right, there it, are just, so it just gets better and better almost. It, it, it does. <laughs> it's, it's so classic. And I, I, I was watching and I'm like thinking, well, who is the number one honey badger in the world? And I was like, it's Trump. Like, oh, yeah. you know what? You could, you could uh, – Sting him with a cobra bite. You can fucking <laughs> you you can uh, you can throw a an entire congress of honeybees on him to sting him. And and this guy is like he's Teflon Don. Like everything bounces off him. He just doesn't give a shit. He just yeah. keeps going. And it, he and is that's the it. perfect honey badger. Like he just don't care. Like he just goes. He, he don't he, give. He don't give one shit. He don't give one shit. He just keeps going. <laughs> yeah. And everything just like he repels right off of him. Yeah. Right. Like he's, how many he, you know. The Rachel Maddow and all these others, they're like, they keep trying to bring him down. And this guy, he can, he's resilient. Yeah, he just, he don't give a shit. He is the ultimate honey, bear, uh, honey badger. And yeah. these things are unbelievable. You know, there's another video that I saw of some guy in South Africa that I think it was South Africa. But anyways, he tried to build um, a, a, an enclosure for his honey badger. And the length that this honey badger went to get out of the enclosure was just like unbelievable. This thing, these things are crazy, crazy creatures. They're honestly, they're, they're, they're just, they're, they're abnormally like super creatures. Like they're just strange. <laughs> it's, it's true. Like you, you see them every now and then you, I've seen videos also of like a pack of lions trying to kill one. And like, nope, that like honey badger don't care. He just, he, he just fights <laughs> off a whole pack of lions or pride of lions. That's just like Trump. The whole world's against him. Trump don't care. Doesn't he matter. Just fight, he just fights them all off. So I think it is the perfect analogy, Patrick. Like I really think you nailed it when you said who well, is you the did a ultimate great job honey badger. Your, well, yeah. thank you very much. So that's it but, for patting each other on the back. We'll we'll, we'll okay. go on to. But but I, let's just circle back to what he did say though. Oh, okay. let's let's just let's actually just actually talk, bring this talk. to the markets. You mean like talk about the markets and yeah. not tiny badger? No, no. Okay. But I I'm I'm fascinated. Okay, so he is the one who picked Powell 
as the Fed chairman. Yeah. And, you know, when he was running for president, he was talking about how the stock markets were in a bubble. One, one person, when I, when I tweeted out the, that, uh, that video, someone responded and, and pointed it out rightfully. And uh, like he was, he was basically saying the markets are in a bubble and, and this is crazy and interest rates should be higher. Back then when he was running, he was saying all this. Now that he's president, he is completely flip-flopped. Yeah, uh, he, and like the, the, the you know the the Dow is up fifty percent since he was elected, but it should be even ten thousand points higher, right? If they well, didn't so, raise interest rates as much so, as they did, Patrick, we can talk about that, but that ends up being kind of politics. And one of the more interesting th discussions I think we might have, instead of kind of talking about how he flipped, because let's face it, he flips whenever he wants. He makes yeah. the narrative whatever he wants. He's to a honey badger, but anyway. Yeah, he's, <laughs> but what does this mean? For the markets, having a president that is this aggressive against the Fed, this is unprecedented because although we've had presidents that have leaned on Fed, uh, you know, Fed chairmen in the past, it was all behind the scenes. Like I know Lyndon Johnson, I believe he choked one of them. Uh, it might have been Fred Burns. I can't remember which one, but he did. He put him up against the wall and choked him. But this was all done behind the scenes. This one is very different in that it was, it's done out in the public. And, and Trump is just not giving in. He just keeps hammering him and hammering him and hammering him. And every single time he turns around, he's talking about lower rates. I, you know, it's going to be increasingly difficult for the Fed to resist this. And I, I think it's going to be a very interesting event that this next week when we do have the Fed meeting to see how much they succumb to that pressure and how much they tilt on the easy, easy side or whether they stick to truly being independent. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And uh, and we'll, we'll certainly find out. It's going to be uh, really interesting. And like, I mean, maybe not in this June meeting. Maybe we might get some language change or something. But Yeah, but if we uh, don't get enough of a, of a move, just think about what Trump's going to do. He's going to honey badger him and he's going to be right back at him. And this is the point. Like, what is this going to do to the market? This is this is this is a bigger deal than people realize and or than a lot of our at least are acknowledging. And I think that it's something that hasn't happened. And whenever you get a situation where something is different, like in, in there's a fundamental change, then you have to ask yourself, is there an opportunity there? And I don't know yet if there is, but I do think that it's something you should be watching and thinking about all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll agree with that. All right. Let's move on. Kev, it's time for the top five things to watch next week. And uh, let's start off by just reviewing last week and just oh. seeing what happened here. Now, so number five, retail sales. Uh, they came in, I guess you could, uh, like to me, they came in in line. Some people were call calling them a little bit hotter, but they didn't disappoint. They didn't, yeah, they it, didn't. It was kind of, a, it wasn't a big event. It's as no. usual, we're picking something that's a big deal and it's not. But we were looking for a miss, right? Just in case, like, if there was a big miss, then that would kind of potentially be uh, ammunition or fuel for, for the Fed to move, right? Well, I think you're saying we were looking. I don't think that was the case. No, that wasn't you the case. You were looking, probably. I was looking. Okay, fine. I was looking. <laughs> but, but no, but retail sales came in in line that it wasn't a big factor okay. uh very quickly visa mastercard they didn't give anything back just yet i mean they continue to be uh i think they're trading great they, they yeah. they're hanging in there they're hunter honey badgering it themselves like they just keep yeah. going higher they just keep going higher no, yeah. nothing seems to be uh, phasing them at yeah. least not yet uh, but number three the this uh, this inflation boogeyman kev <laughs> Is uh, is nowhere to be found. It keeps falling into the basement. Uh, I, I saw you you giving me some stabs on Twitter there about the the yeah. inflation. I and you're right. It's not. It hasn't come yet. But uh, don't forget what our buddy Steve uh, Stevie Vick said. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the second half. So I'm hanging tough, buddy. Now you haven't convinced me yet. <laughs> All right. I can't wait to take you down in the okay. uh, in in Chicago, man. This is gonna be good. All right. So uh, number two, gold. Uh, and uh, it's fa a great time to be recording because we literally had an attempt for gold to break out to 52-week new highs today. Right. And literally in the la uh, few hours right now before we started recording, it pulled a little bit of a prairie dog, didn't it? I think a little. It's not just a little bit of a prairie dog. Prairie dog. That's a huge prairie dog. 
That's like a big, yeah. huge uh, alpha male prairie dog if I've ever seen one. <laughs> Don't you think? An alpha male prairie dog. Right? That's a new term for our <laughs> listeners. That it's not just a prairie dog. This is an alpha male prairie dog. But That's, you know, wh- where I'm a little bit worried about uh, this pop that, and and failure is is that uh, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, wh- when when he makes that much headline about being super bullish gold. It causes the, the typical market event where there's a wave of people that just chase his idea. Yeah. And, um, and while P- uh, Paul will probably be right over 12 to 24 months, you have to think that this little surge could have been brought about by people that are just getting a little bit ahead of themselves. And, um, and that break to higher high was just a move to draw everyone in. And I think the, the one big tell as to why uh, gold is doing that is so it has to, I think, have a little to do with the, f- the fact that the dollar was up so much today. The dollar index right. had a pretty big move. And it's going to be hard for gold to just run away. Uh, when uh, when the dollar is strengthening like this, you know another thing I see that Gunlock also guttered it by getting on the jumping on the gold buying bandwagon. Oh, not Gunlock. Yeah, he so guttered it. Yeah, well, I think if we got Gartman, it would be the trifecta. Oh, that would be the trifecta. That would that would you're done at that yeah, moment. You're done. <laughs> Short all the gold you can. So it, it, you no, know what? The only the, the last kiss of death is if we were both along. Yeah, oh, shit, we both are. Long. No, I. You know what? Oh, I'm you're afraid. long silver. Give me I'm, a break. I'm long silver, which has got a little more juice. And I was, I thought it was wor- working, but then today oh I God. got hammered. Today, like <laughs> as bad as gold is, silver's worse. So I'm having a tough day. But anyways, let's All go right. on. So Renminbi, and this, what I found really interesting about the uh, the Chinese yuan is the fact that uh, China came out warning before the G20. Uh, saying to the to the uh, renminbi bears, saying be careful. <laughs> ah, be careful. Be careful. Uh, you know, uh, but oh but my god, here you are with your ter- terrible chart again. Flip it, buddy. Uh, do you're you, always do I have doing to? the. Ch- yeah, you do, because that's the wrong. Oh. Ch- every nobody looks at renminbi as like point one four four three. There we go. So there you go. You got your U.S. dollar. How it's trading against renminbi? Are you yeah, happy? That's you're happy. Thing. Yeah, yeah right. I'm happy. That's I. I we're gonna we're gonna I, fight about that one till the like till the day we split up and stop. But uh, we get a okay. divorce anyway. So the U.S. dollar's rallying. So congratulations. You got another U.S. <laughs> dollar chart up for you. Okay, so. Uh, so anyway, but you can see that's edging up there. So what I'm fa- what I'm going to be really fascinated to see is whether or not um, th- this makes. Well, I, you know what? Let's be realistic. Odds are it should stay pinned into the G20. Like the, the, the odds, the odds that China like it is a it is a managed currency, and the PBOC is pegging it. And they're controlling the flow, and there w- there is no political advantage for them letting the currency go before the G20. So I actually disagree with you. If I was really, them, yeah, I would let it go, and I would get everyone hot and bothered and buying the buying the breakout in this, meaning selling Renminbi, and then I would hammer them. So wait, selling Renminbi? Maybe we should flip the chart so people understand no. what you freaking mean. <laughs> oh. Here we go, selling the renminbi. Now we're talking. Okay, okay. whatever. So <laughs> the reality is that I think they, they let the support go. And then what happens is they get draw in all those kind of technical people and everyone that gets all hot and bothered and then they just slam them. And they slam them and then everybody's offside and there's a lot of late, late positions. And I, I, could very, I could very well see that. I'm not writing that off. Everyone thinks you know that what? seven's going to hold. I could very well see it going through seven, sucking everybody Take in, up. and then doing it. Yeah, that's possible. You know yeah. what? Personally, I don't trade uh, this currency pair. Yeah, I don't either because it's, it's, yeah. it's a – you might as well – it's a political game. It's not yeah. really – it's not trading on fundamentals. It's, 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 better, it's better to trade the, uh, the repercussions of if that broke, what would it mean? And you could, yeah. you could play the Aussie. You could play the yen. There's all sorts of different um, uh, cross relationships that you, you'll be able to play the periphery and have a cleaner – uh, trade setup than than uh, trying to trade this one. The one thing I will say that I like trading is gold priced in renminbi, 
And I remember when that broke 8,200 and everyone was getting all bearish. And I said, nope, that's going to hold. And it's popped from there. It's rallied from 8,200 to 9,200. This thing is just continues to run. I think it's going to be one of the better trades uh, for the next uh, little while. I continue to lo love gold priced in, uh, in one. All right. So let's, uh, let's definitely something to continue to watch, but, uh, you know what? Uh, I'm still curious. Wouldn't it be interesting if, if gold never gave back? Well, you know, forget it. Let's move on. This is the, it, it was a prairie dog. We'll leave it at that. All right. Let's get to the top five things to watch next week. Right. And so, uh, next week, what is the uh, number five? Well, I wanted to just give lip service to the European and U.S. PMIs, both manufacturing and service PMIs coming out. And, you know, this is obviously the uh, this is where a lot of the leading indicators for potential recession all kind of rear their heads, right? Like uh, the, the PMIs have generally been gravitating toward 50. And in the case of Europe, they've already been below 54 sometimes, particularly in a few of the places like Germany, right? Here, let me just give an example. So this is, this is the um, chart of, uh, oh, well, there we go. This is this is the chart of German PMIs, right? And so we've now gone on to four or five months of negative uh, uh, manufacturing PMI in Germany, right? And uh, and I think the what P they need is lower rates and more yes. fiscal austerity because because I think minus that's twenty work. basis points yeah. is is not enough in order to ramp up manufacturing. You got to go minus fifty basis points. Yeah, like, who are like you kidding? Right? You know that's just insane. Like it's, yeah. it, it's the, the idea that they're going to continue doing that. That is like not just bat shit crazy. That's like flying Fox, the golden crown <laughs> flying Fox of the world's largest bat in the world. That kind of yeah. flying Fox bat shit crazy. That's how dumb their, pro their policies are. Yeah. And they continue to do it. And, and the, 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 the odyssey, like I can't even say the idiocy of them trying to do this is just dumb how they think they're going to just do more and it's going to fix their problem it's just it's crazy they're you no know, what's just... the problem with their negative interest rates is that the u.s is not negative enough so we just need we need powell to get onto bandwagon no because it's what not they enough need... that <laughs> what they need to do is an actual proper fiscal stimulus yeah. and it's, it's 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 very clear and the whole world knows it and and for some reason they they seem to think that more of the same is going to solve their problem and it's not so anyways, yeah. and, and so anyway, this is the U.S. Uh, later that day. So it's a Friday overnight is, is going to be where the European numbers come out. And then you have Friday at 945 a.m. You're going to have the uh, the flash manufacturing PMI in the U.S. And what's interesting is, OK, so we had we were up around the 56, 57 on the uh, PMIs back in uh, 2018. But they literally have been falling off a cliff in 2019 and this is what's got uh trump's panties all wound up about uh cutting interest rates because he sees that these are kind of leading indicators that are uh, that are potentially uh suggesting increased probability of recession and and he's blaming powell that the reason that this is happening is because interest rates are too high right and so it'll be very interesting in my mind to see whether this trend continues right well I, I'm not going to say it's going to end this month, this week, but I think one of these times the bear, the economic bears out there have priced in almost like a recession. And Pretty one much. of these times we're going to get a situation where it does, if it, if it does manage to stabilize and head higher, there's going to be a wicked, wicked sell off at the, in the bond market. That's how, that's what I think. Oh, you know, Jesus it's all, Christ. it's all about expectations. And I think that it's very difficult to continue to get bad enough economic, in, uh, you know, numbers to satisfy you economic bears. But we'll see. You know what? That's what makes a market. We're on the well, other listen, side. I, Patrick, I I'll lie. see you in the machine. I'll see you in the oh, machine, buddy. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Listen. All right. All right. Forget it. We'll meet you in the machine. All right. We'll leave it at that. So number four, I want to get to uh, talking about lumber and home builders. So, I, uh, you know, I was listening to Josh Steiner. Uh, he was on Macro Voices. and He's uh, from Hedgeye. A hedge eye guy, yeah. and he, uh, he, uh, he was 
uh, obviously bearish Canadian real estate, but uh, but he was bullish U.S. Re uh, real estate, and he's a smart he, guy, he was, that Josh Stein. Yeah, and and he was he was obviously supporting your idea of of home builders going higher, and uh, and so I really wanted to talk about lumber. Uh, and lumber prices and as well as how these home builders are behaving right and so what what was uh, particularly interesting to me uh, was that lumber in the last week has really started to rip i mean uh it, like on the chart it doesn't look like it's huge but i mean for one week that was pretty much like a 25 percent rise in lumber prices in one week yeah unbelievable it's That's, crazy man on a percentage uh, basis, on the, in terms of uh, duration, like just a, a one week, that's a huge move. For sure. Um, and uh, and so lumber's ripping, and um, and home builders are doing pretty well. And you are right now winning the bet. We'll talk about our bet out about our bets in a, in a little bit because we have a, we have a home builders versus bonds bet that we can talk about. But right now, anyway, the home builder chart looks great. And it's and there's no alpha male prairie dog to be in any. There's none to be found. Like yeah. this, it continues to strengthen and go higher, and um, and so the, the, it's like, are the home builders gonna here do another rip? I I love this. You know, I love them. I think they're gonna lead. <laughs> I I no listen. You laugh. Yeah. But the reality no, no, no. is, that, I'm, I'm that not, I'm not, I'm not laughing. I'm not the, I'm not shorting them or something like that. Okay, right? but like, the so. reality is that you, you bond, you economic bears have taken the bond yields down to levels that even if the Fed doesn't go ahead and just like do what you want them, want them to do, you've still taken down rates. You know, at the thirty and thirty year, which to is levels, very stimulative to real estate. Yeah, we're yeah. listen, and and the and we talked about Trump always trying to get rates lower. Like, what's not to love? Like, what? Like, rates are going lower in the U.S. in terms of there's there's at the very least there's going to be no um, Federal Reserve that's leaning hard like they were a year ago or not even a yeah. year ago, six months ago. And that was the problem. Uh, six months ago, they were actively leaning against the economy. That is going to be gone. And we're going to find that all those millennials that are, that have been living in their parents' basement or hold up like six of them in a, in a condo are going to start buying houses. Now here in Canada, the millennials all own like four condos because they're all speculating on, on real estate because it's been going up. But in the States, there's been none of that. And all well, of the not real to that same magnitude. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you have to go, if you go places like San Francisco and shit like that, there's like yeah. pockets, but uh, you're talking, if you're talking about the whole U S market, you're dead right. Yeah, I think I what I would like to own is like Kentucky, you know, single family homes. I think those are headed higher. I I really do believe right. that. I think that that you should never buy the the like the reason that no one wants to own real estate is because everyone remembers two thousand and eight uh, two thousand and eight, and it's just like that was technology. a consumer recession, and it's not going to be a consumer recession this time. Right, around. and and we're going to find that the those millennials that have been you know holding off. Uh, forming families and buying homes they're they're gonna do what every generation always does like everyone tells me oh the millennials are different yeah they're slightly different and, but they're at the end of the day everyone's gonna go and and you know the, the desire to have families isn't gone it's yes it might be muted a little and it might can be I, can I offer you a speculation and i want you to call me an idiot if not uh if, if you think it's thing but if i saw legislation that basically gave student loan forgiveness for that $1.6 trillion or whatever the number is of student loan debt out there, which is off held by the millennials at that age that are thinking about buying. If you suddenly had relief, that could actually uh, create an impulse wave of buying that would drive uh, a new wave of home ownership. Would you think, what do you think? Is that a crazy idea or what do you no, think? No, it's not a crazy idea at all. I'd be buying it with both hands and both feet and, you know, everything, every other appendage I have. So, because the reality yeah. is that they would be going and creating the, like, demanding it and creating the credit that, uh, that we've been sold. Like, you always talk about this. You always talk about the fact that there's no demand for credit. Nobody wants to borrow. I would argue that there's a lot of times they're not, not able to borrow, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
That's the creditworthiness, cool. right? Like for sure. Well, you are correct, though, that the, the demand has been limited. And uh, if we saw what you just said, they would instantly go spend and it would be hugely inflationary. The home builders would rip. And, and before we go any further, I just want to talk. We were talking about lumber. I had a good buddy, a smart fellow that I know. We were talking about value stocks. And he was telling me how he's buying all the Canadian tree, tree stocks. He really? says these things, yeah, he's just telling me how cheap these things were and they're just trading like death and nobody likes them and they're just down and out. And I, 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 I'm going to go do some work on that because I think it might be, you know, another way to play it. And I, and I believe if we remember Aiden uh, yeah. from Pavilion Matt, yeah, he was a big believer in buying those names as well. So I not only do I like home builders, I think I'm going to like eventually warm up to the tree stocks as well. Yeah, the lumber stocks might be interesting. Well, one last thing. What what's the so one of the reasons why look, I'm super bearish the broader stock market. And no, so one of the really? one no, you would have never guessed. But <laughs> but so to me, one of the hesitations of buying home builders is I am just not looking for equity exposure to the if I was, then home builders would certainly make the list. But what do you think of the pairing of uh, doing uh Long home builders short the S and P pairing. Is that a silly idea, or what? Do no, you not at all. Question? I like it because I think it's going to outperform. And if you're looking for a lower risk, and you think that there's other things within the S and P that are way overpriced, like the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Apples of the world, and you could see a situation where the real economy gets going, I could see that trade working in spades. I have no problems yeah. with that trade at all. You know, I yeah. give you a hard time because I think you're a little too bearish. It's not like I'm necessarily believe that that everything is going to rip and i am worried about those big names continuing to be able to lead because i do think that there's going to be a shift to other types of companies and that oh, might sure. mean the overall index not doing as well as as i as some other sectors so i have no problem yeah. with that trade i like it actually a lot all right so uh let's move on so number three uh i wanted to talk about the small cap divergence okay. and um so, okay, let's let's just uh, put this in context by charts. So uh, let me let me pull up uh, quickly here. Let's start off actually with the chart on the S and P. No, actually, no. Let's use the Dow. We always look at the S and P. Let's uh, let's start with looking at the Dow Jones here. So this is just the Dow Jones futures. But so y what we had was basically the Dow Jones made it all the way back up to its highs back in um, April. Well, not not higher highs, but it made it pretty much back to its highs. And even during this rally, this rally has been pretty strong and it's just a stone's throw away from making it back to those highs. Right. Right. Uh, the small caps, though, which uh, the Russell 2000, which is uh, looking at the 2000 smaller cap names outside of that. Uh, I think they exclude the top 1000. So you're looking at the lower tiers. Is, that, is it the, the below the, the top 1000? Is it the Russell's 2000? Um, um, anyway, uh, okay. it's something like that. Well, I don't, I don't know specifically. And if you don't, that's fine. But, but, uh, the, the, this is the August high. And what's interesting is that the Russell never made it back to those highs the way the S and P and Dow and NASDAQ did. Right. Right. And it's, 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 this, it's, it's, it's stinking. It's, it's like yeah. not a chance. The small caps now, and, okay, and I'll let you finish before we go on. But, but look at this rally. This, this rally in the last week when the S&P was toying with this big breakout, the Russell, there's no other way to put it. They're trading like shit. Like this is a pathetic rally uh, and, uh, and, and nowhere near the gusto that this, the large caps are, are ripping at. And, uh, and so the question, is this a, a better gauge? And I'm, I'm – uh, as to what the real underpinning situation in the economy and the markets are uh, than the large caps. Is this divergence telling you that things should be as bearish as I am? Or are you going to somehow give me the bullish spin on this? Go for it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure whether it's just a pause and we're about to you know, catch up. Don't forget that the... Um, wasn't it? Didn't they rip earlier? Like, didn't the small caps outperform? I'm just pulling it up on my Bloomberg. Oh yeah, you know, the, right here. You're talking about this rip, right? Which is that they during the 2018 first half of 2018, they made higher highs. Like, what happened here was that uh, when the VIX blew, uh, the uh, the VIX explosion occurred, 
then the S and P barely made it back to its highs, but the Russell kept ripping. Right. This is what you're talking about, right? This is so, what you mean, I, right? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for you, Patrick. I'm not going to look at that okay, divergence but, but and can say. Can you agree well, with that, me? Can you agree can, with me? Well, that, obviously, that, charts don't lie, so it's telling you that it's it's stinking. Whether this is an opportunity to buy small caps or whether it's a sign of the the next apocalypse coming, you know, I don't know. You you believe this is the end of the world signal and that we should sell everything because of it? I I, I I'll I'm tell not you this sure. much. I if the Russell can't break those highs from April, then I would take that as uh, that the underlying breadth of the market is incredibly weak and uh, and that you can't trust rallies and you know whether you look at the uh, transportation index which is behaving like this or whether uh, any of those other things that, that uh, even like look at your um, uh, regional banks like in the same yeah, way they, just they suck they, they're, they're, they're terrible they're, that's been a, they're, another they're great terrible. one of my that's a terrible you know kevin muir you know, trade there and, you go uh, like, well, yeah, of course it is a terrible <laughs> trade of yours, but but uh, but at the you know like uh, you take a look like look at the rally in um, transport index, very yeah. very weak, and so so the thing is is that you have a lot of this underpinning market that isn't ripping higher the way the S and P did, and the way I the all I want to leave our listeners with and and give you my uh, two cents. Is, is either one of two things. Either the breadth of the market's going to improve and then you and Brent Johnson can have your little kumbaya moment as the market goes uh, and actually rips to all-time new highs. But if the, if the underpinning stock market from these indices uh, continues to trade as shit as it has been in the last week, the bulls are screwed. You heard it from me here. Uh, I think that that's just going to be an indication that the market is just going to roll over into the summer. That, and that's my opinion. Any, any last comment? No, I think that's a great way to leave that one. You, you heard it here. The bulls are screwed if the Russell doesn't rally. Right. All right. Number two, I want to talk about the Aussie dollar. And, you know, I mean, we talked last week and we talk, uh, reviewed it here about the, uh, about the renminbi uh, and uh, certainly China has, is a big storyline in, uh, in what's happening with the Aussie dollar. Now, I know your favorite trade, and rightfully so, it's been a great trade, has been the Aussie CAD pair, right? One Short second, Aussie one second, CAD. Patrick. I have to timestamp a ticket because I think you just said something nice. <laughs> I gave you kudos like a week or two ago on this trade before. Look, <laughs> uh, you, look, not not every one of your trades are bad. Like, just most. Oh of my them. god, the compliments uh, just keep coming. I don't know if I can handle this. <laughs> okay. You nailed one. You nailed okay. one. Your your Aussie bear story uh, versus you know what, cat has been worked. So well, so, you know what? I I don't know because the reality is maybe I would have been better off to short Aussie. I'm not sure, but I still like I like Aussie cat better than I like Aussie straight. No, but your but your but your the re rationale behind your Aussie cat was really good. Yeah, uh, like. And just but, wait, but so listen, much. just wait until oil gets up off the mat because everybody's shitting all over oil right now. Wait till it gets off the mat. CAD's going to actually rally. This is this trade's, uh, I suspect, now I probably just goochered it, but I suspect this You're trade is going to get better still. I, I'm not opposed to it, but, but I wanted to talk about the Aussie dollar, the U.S. dollar, Aussie cross. And... The U.S. dollar had um, uh, pulled back and all these cross currencies bounced. But the f uh, other than the pound sterling, the Aussie is so, was so quick to get right back to its May lows. Like it wants to give out this major support line. Well, do you, one second, Patrick. Do you know why that is? Uh, please indulge me. Was it the, the elections that occurred there? No, it's not that at all. Remember back to January 3rd, 2019, there was a, right. an illiquid. Oh, you're going, oh, get to, you're going to give me the bad tick shit. Yes. There's no such thing as a bad tick, buddy. Oh, Jesus Christ. We're headed okay. down to 66 because you watch this thing. That market ticked on that day at 65.80. We're going to. Well, my wallet that hopes that you're right. My yeah. wallet does hope you're right. All right. Uh, but, no such but, thing as a bad tick. I'll tell you. I know you don't believe in that theory, but uh, many decades of watching the three, in fact, as you remind me so, all the time so okay. all right. of watching all the right. markets, so, there's no such thing as a bad tick. 
Okay, so let's flip this over. Hold on a second. Because uh, the, uh, the other place I had a bad tick was the, uh, the yen. I, and again, I flipped the chart. Yes, you can shit on me all you want. But, but so we have here the bad tick as the yen rallied in the U.S. Yeah, dollar. I, I completely think that. I, I, I'm completely fine with that. Can you put okay, this? So, can you please put no, it to the so, real chart? I can't. Oh Jesus! It, it messes oh, yeah, yeah. me up to see a watch that way. <sighs> All right. <laughs> there you go. Are you happy? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. No. For sure. We're going. We'll go below 105. Okay. I'm with. I'm. Oh I'm no such thing oh as a God. bad tick. All right. You know. In in the spirit, in the spirit of the fact that we talked about trading places, I think it's time to pull out a Duke and Duke here, uh, because I. Don't think it's going to. Okay, but on the yen, now Aussie will, but not the yen. I don't think the yen. Uh, I don't think we're going to see 105. Okay, well that's fine. You're on. Duke and Duke, a dollar. You're, yeah, we're going to do on. this. But yeah, yeah, for sure. A year from now, you're on. A year from now. Come on, that's like that's like how many handles lower? It's on a downtrend right now. Like okay, okay. you could say over oh, the next five years it's going to hit 105. <laughs> you okay, okay. you can. Okay, end of year. I'll give you end of year. That's like what two thirds of a months? year. Yeah, or what? No, let's do end of year. It's a, it's a end of year. I think yeah. it'll take. I think it takes below 105 this year. Okay. You're All right, right. Uh, Lena, write that one down for us, please. Okay. Because we're we, we're we're gonna need to start tracking these. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. But uh, but anyway, uh, so let's go back to the Aussie here for a second. The point is, incredibly weak and in a very pronounced downtrend, and it doesn't look like it's stopping. I mean, are we heading to 65 or 60 cents on the Aussie in your mind? I think we're headed lower. Like I think lower Australia than sixty five sixty. Oh yeah, like oh so you're like in the Grant Williams. It's going to oh yeah. Cents. I think Grant's on to something. Oh yeah, I have no problem with Grant's. Like what is Grant calling for? Fifty cents. Fifty cents. Yeah, 50 I have cents. no problem like, with that. So like the, I, the, let's see if we go far enough back. Yeah, the Aussie. So we we saw sixty cents back in two thousand eight, and we saw fifty cents back in two thousand one. So yeah, have I have to no go. problem. I, I have no problem with Grant's call. Grant's calling for fifty cents. I'm with Grant. I well, I think things are like I think it's gonna well, be well for very... all of our all of our Aussie listeners. No, I love Australia. Known. Don't think no no that no. I'm let like it be bearish. no, but let it be known that you should be long U.S. dollars, Canadian dollars, or anything else other than your own domestic currency. Because Kevin Muir said you're going full Argentina here. <laughs> no, I. <I'm... laughs> <laughs> no, I just I, I I think that they no okay I, I'm I'm actually somewhat defend. in agreement with you that yeah I know but down, that's so. why they should actually go the other way they should buy yeah. their currency because this has got to be the bottom if we both agree but I no well, I'm the, bearish like I'm with I'm with Grant this price action is shit and it, it it does feel like it's going lower but anyway we're gonna find out whether or not it breaks potentially next week so this is something our our listeners need to watch i think it's pretty yeah. important it's it's by far one of the weakest currencies out there and so if you want to if you want to short the weakest currency uh aussie's right there and the pound's uh, trying to compete with it but uh, anyway it's harder to play the pound because of the political stuff number one kev we already talked about this so much with uh, john and everyone is fomc statement next week but we ha it has to be number one we have to see what happens there what happens from that press conference how does the market react i'm curious whether the s p being pinned the way it has been all week has everything to do with everyone's just waiting for the fed before they make their move i don't know like a lot of things have gotten pinned I think that the yeah. So FX, like, what no, what but if, like the like, vol the volatility has gone down in a lot of instruments. I think that uh, you look at FX uh, ranges. It's been one of the quietest uh, you know periods for the euro until recently, like until this last week. I think there's a lot of compression going on in in a lot of volatility squares, and that all everyone thinks that S and P has to move so much. It doesn't. And there's lots of summers that I remember owning. You know what I thought was cheap vol at ten or twelve, and just bleeding theta. Like just I remember it, and you always laugh at me saying that I hate oh, being you hate being long theta. I just puked a little bit in my mouth. Yeah, but I I could tell you why <coughs> I hate being long theta is because I, I've I've experienced what it's like in that yeah. summer when nothing's happening, and a lot of so a you lot really of long vol that nothing's traders. Nothing's gonna happen this summer. Like is that what you're is that what you're suggesting here? So this is this is the trade I love. I would own FX vol and I and, all, and fixed income vol 
while selling equity vol any day of the week. Now, FX follows had a big move up because of the recent yeah. volatility. So I don't know if I chase that, but I would love owning FX vol against equity vol any day. People consistently are over. Yeah, but but, for but it's vol. not like but it's not like equity vols back down to ten or twelve. I but, mean the VIX but, is uh, still trading fifteen sixteen here. So you you uh, you. Uh, I have no you, problem being short fifteen sixteen against being long the uh, the FX vol. No like problem. You're talking at all. about the move index and shit like this. And well, the, yeah, but I just vol. I just I I just think that everyone is consistently overpaying for equities because you guys all think the end of the world's coming in equities. But and what if we it might, does? Well, then I'll be screwed. <laughs> I'll be screwed. Like no, without a doubt. If it, if it, if it ends up being that it is an equity crisis and that every hedge fund and every, uh, you know, uh, person on zero hedge and Twitter is right, that it's going to manifest itself exactly like 2008. Well, then I'll have been wrong, and uh, I guess uh, the meet you and the machine will prove it in the P&L, right? Like, so, yeah. uh, but yeah. I just don't see that as a compelling trade. I don't, right. I don't like buying hedges that everyone else buys. I like buying hedges for things that people aren't expecting because I think those, by their very nature, are what catches people and creates those sorts of crises. You know, yeah. that, that, that no one's expecting. So I don't want to buy what everyone thinks is going to be the next crisis. I want to buy yeah. what nobody's expecting. I think a better trade, if I wanted to hedge my portfolio right now, I would be buying, I don't know, $100 oil calls that are long dated. I'm not sure because I'm more worried. Everyone's, you know, concerned about China and the trade tariffs and the trade wars there. I'm more worried about a real war, you know, in the Gulf of Hormuz or whatever it is. Like, I, I yeah. think that there's more of a chance of that catching everyone off guard than there is about something happening in China. So do I think the Chinese situation is going to get worse? For sure. I completely could see those trade breaking down. But do I think that's already in the market? Again, for sure. Do I think that the problems in the Mideast are in the market? Not a chance. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's my All right, sense. But there's that's my rant. Mind. So we have... Two quick housekeeping things that we didn't put yeah. in the top. Oh wait, let me do it. Let me. No, yeah, yeah. So, so that we, I'll let you do it. So, there's okay. two things. Number one, uh, hey. there's the June futures rollover, and two is the quad. So, why don't you? Uh, give oh, okay. A, that a was quick, another housekeeping. Yeah, yeah. You, you do, okay. You so, do those first of all, for everyone that trades futures, remember that it's the uh, we're rolling over into SEPs. So we're going from on most financial futures from an M, which is June, into SEPs, which is U. That's the first thing. And then we have the quad witching and the quadruple witching on next Friday. So that's a big deal. I believe it's also an S&P rebalance day. So it should be a lot yeah, of there's action. Yeah, there's going to be uh, – that's when the dealers are going to get a lot of their gamma exposure spiking as well. So it's, it sets up for – and it's interesting that it, that's going to be at the same time a few days before the Fed. Um, so, like, it, it could be volatile next week. For sure. Like, there, it, could be, it could be a lot of fun. Um, I, I know personally – that on those quad wi quadruple wishing days, it's they're tough to trade, even the day or two before it, um, because they do. For day traders, when when you say that's tough right, to trade, that's right. I trade. I find that it makes no sense, and you have to be uh, almost putting aside what you think should happen and just kind of going with stuff because some weird shit happens. Just be yeah. aware. Then yeah, okay, let's so move let's move on to the next housekeeping item, which I I first want to have um, my own my own mea culpa. Uh, two weeks ago, Patrick and I made a bet on oil. We yeah. taped it on Thursday, and uh, we didn't get a chance to air the, the, the episode until Saturday, our regular Saturday morning release. And my bet was so bad, and I was trading so cold at the time, that I had lost my bet before it e the show even aired. That's how bad my <laughs> trading was. I'm and not going to say on, anything. So I went on Other to trade... So I went on I Twitter and I completely said, you know, I, I made fun of myself. I said, look, this is how bad I am. I can't even do a trade that uh, that uh, doesn't lose even before it's aired. So I think the bet was something. I think crude oil was trading what it fifty six bucks at the time, and and you yeah. you picked me. It was off a one for, touch to fifty three fifty. Yeah, and I think it hit the. We taped it for Thursday night, and it uh, Friday morning we got up and it hit it. So. So kudos to you, Patrick. You did well. You you picked me off. You got uh, me there. You know what? I got lucky. Yeah, and that's I so lucky. I owe you a burger. The next point I we want to kind of make is a big shout out to our buddy Devin Craig Craigan, sorry, um, who is a student at WSU. Now we looked this up. We think it's Washington State University. 
uh, which is near Spokane, and it's right on the border of Montana. He was kind enough to go through the uh, hours of Market Huddle, and I feel sorry for him. Like, that must be a long time. And yeah. he compiled a list of all of our bets. Which, thank God. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, it's because uh, I haven't been writing them down. And so, yeah. like, it's he did awesome it all for us. So great. He looks like a terrific guy. Go give him a follow because he's a nice guy. Devin underscore Cragen, C R A G I N. He's got a picture of him and his dog. I like him already. He's my kind of guy. So he put together all of our bets. And, um, I, I, you know, one of the things that I do like is that I think you tried to claim some of the more stakes after you won them, and now he's confirming that they're burgers, so I'm looking good that way. If I'm going to lose bets, at least I'm only losing burger bets and not steak bets. So wh- uh, where is our big steak bet? Hold on a second here. Our, uh, um, no, Christmas dinner is the Home Builders TLT. And right that's now, right. That's, like our like like, that's our big one. Like That's our big one, the big Christmas dinner where it's going to be lots of drinking and lots of steaks and stuff. So actually, you know, let's have a dial of that. Let's. What day was it that we put that on? Uh, um, that was uh, episode five. Never go full Krugman. Uh, yeah. That was back in December, and that for, what we did there was the the home builders against the TLT, and rightfully so. I should have uh, d- done a risk parity thing on this adjustment because the TLT has been freaking rock starring. But but the, at the same time, back in December was uh, the bloodbath and the uh, and the. Home builders were right at that bottom, and so like okay. So is that December? Like De- is that December twelfth? I'm gonna do a little chart. No, December eighth. December eighth. December okay, 8th. sorry, that's my dyslexia kicking in again. Okay, yeah, let's have yeah, a look here. December eighth. I'm gonna put it in here to see who's yeah. up. I just want curious. Well, you're you're up. Going to be like thirty percent against like seven eight percent or something, right? Like what is it? I don't know. Let's just let's have. A I look just here. I saw off the top of my head. That's my guess. Holy shit! You're in trouble, buddy. I'm up twenty five percent almost. You're up twelve. Yeah, so you're up 25% from date, and I'm up yeah. 12. Yeah. Actually, it's not as bad as I thought. Um, you're screwed. <laughs> you're screwed. I'm still gonna win because, like, what? Like, look, home builders might be a might still be one of the better sectors, but when the market gets slammed here into the downside, okay. that home builders are gonna go down with the market on a relative basis, <sighs> and I'm gonna look like a rock star. You're you know, you're okay. you're done. Then you woke uh, up that, and you had to change your sheets. Like that was that's that's you're just brutal, buddy. You're down <laughs> you're down twelve hundred basis points and you're trash talking me. You're just brutal. Okay. Anyways, that's fine. Let's continue on. What else do we got here? Then what other bets? Do we anyway, for, uh, just shout out Devin. Thanks a lot for coming. Yes, that's this. right. Wait, you, we can't and, go through them. He's done all this work. We got to figure out a couple other ones. Kevin, uh, but but no no but uh, so we have the one the Duke and Duke today, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, oh, there's the other big know. one. So the other big one was the 2% on the, yes. on the, on the bond That's and you almost won that. But see, you know, this is, this is, I'm a little bit wise. That's a I must, dinner. No, it isn't. It's a, yes, Duke it is. And, it's a Duke and Duke gentleman's wager. Look at here. Where? This is my buddy, Devin. Help me out. Where was this? Go look. Oh, it is a Duke and Duke. See, Fuzz. I knew it. You were trying to get me. You were trying to pick me off. So Devin, buddy, you come up to Toronto. I'll buy you the steak dinner. Because you oh, just sh- saved me a steak dinner when I lose that bet. Anyways, <laughs> thanks again, buddy. It's a re- we really appreciate it. We're going to put this up. We're going to work this in somehow, and we're going to figure it all out. We really we really appreciate it. It's great to see uh, listeners involved, and, and uh, it's uh, thanks again. All right. All right. So, Kev, t- just a, a closing uh, parting words of wisdom. Okay, I thought this one was kind of fun. It's uh, it's one of the ones from 1688, which I figured is you would love because of market history. And it says, "Can profits are like eels, how easily they slip away." And I think that's uh, how you know how true is that? How true is that? Just you when know, you think you, just when you think you know something is when it gets you right. Oh, no, it's like you know what it is is that every time I see the big profits and you're like thinking that this is your moment, often th- it's taking the profits at that moment that that is that before they slip away is such a hard emotional thing to do yeah oh, you know what and actually oh, can i take can i interrupt for one second patrick because yeah. i will say one thing that i've learned over the years this is a little bit of trading couch for you when the volatility goes up in your portfolio and you find yourself with outsized losses it's easy to say that you should reduce your positions at that point 
because you know you're you're losing the PL is, is is right there in front of you but the volatility is going up so let's say you're trading you know something and there's uh all of a sudden there's a a, a volatility expansion and now something that has usually been trading you know two dollar swings is now trading five dollar swings and it's going against you it's easy to say i got to get out of this it's not working for me but i have found that that advice too often isn't applied the other way and i am not saying that you should go and when you get a big win you should go and take it all off because it's a big win because we all know that letting your profits run is one of the most important you know yeah. adages in trading but i do believe that when you get a volatility expansion also to the upside you need to reduce your positions because you won't be able to sit through the increased volatility. And I think that is a really important thing to remember. And I, I don't know what, what triggered me, you were just chatting about stuff, but volatility expansions either way require you to reduce the risk in your portfolio. Well, parting words of wisdom for all of our listeners. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, the, listen, we're, we're going to have this continued conversation here with John. So all yeah. of our listeners hey. stick around. Any Listen, you can follow uh, One second, on before Twitter. we do that, Patrick, do you like the picture of me getting ready to go uh, scuba diving with you? Uh, well, I want actually. I want to wait till the end because I want Lena to talk to uh, talk to talk to. Okay, let's save picture. it for Lena. So let's 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 just yeah. wrap up here and then we'll. Yeah, go so, on. but just quickly, you can follow us um, at the Market Huddle. To let whenever we have uh, all the releases of our different episodes. Just a quick note. Uh, those of you that find the show uh, too much to absorb in one shot, you can gr uh, go to the Market Huddle segments um, just on any of the podcast players. And you can play all the different segments separately so you can listen to it in pieces and still get all of the show. So it's a, one of the better ways to do it. Again, so follow us on Twitter. You can follow Kevin Muir uh, on Twitter as well at, at Kevin Muir. You can follow myself at Patrick Ceresna. And uh, anything we forgot to mention? No, just a big thank you for everybody for listening. Thank you to oh. Lena for putting up with us. And uh, a big, uh, big thanks to John for coming on and being such a great guest. Yeah, well, we're going to go in the after hours here with for John. Sure. But listen, everyone, whoever is in for a good time in Chicago, may, uh, book the book the trip or the little road trip or wherever it is to get to Chicago. You know what's the beautiful thing about Chicago? It's in the dead center of North America. So nobody, whether you're on the West Coast or East Coast, nobody has an excuse not to get to Chicago. It's right in the middle. There right? we go. You heard and, it from and Patrick. So, so we are going to have a market huddle meetup. Uh, after the the global macro edge uh, uh, little event at where, the show. Where you're going to get destroyed. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. And uh, and the point is, is that we're going to go out for drinks. And so anyone who wants to have beers with uh, Kevin Muir, myself, and, uh, and John Neto, and actually some of the other speakers that will be there, it's going to be a great event. Uh, it'll be a great time. So hopefully we'll see many of you out there. We'll give all the details in, in the coming shows as to where we're meeting and the time. But you know, put it on your calendars, 20, June, July 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Our, our part, segment is on the 21st on the Sunday and it's going to uh, be an, an epic battle Patrick you and I uh, bull and bear so we're good. finally going to get just like a full-on you know cage match cage match it's you heard it here down, okay right. thanks for listening All everybody right. thanks for Let's let's we'll, we'll be back with John in just a moment All right, so uh, here we are in the uh, After Hours show with John. Uh, welcome back. Uh, that was a great interview we had earlier. So uh, I want to kind of just uh, start this conversation uh, because you live out in Las Vegas. And yes. uh, the, the impression, of course, I get when I hear someone living in Las Vegas is that, uh, well, you know, you live um, a, 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 an exciting lifestyle. And, uh, but then I found out that you're actually doing law school at night. Like, uh, who, who in Vegas, uh, instead of partying, you're going and doing law school? Like, what's up with that? Yeah, I, I know it's weird. Like, I love, like, growth. Like, self-growth <laughs> is kind of cool. And, like, that book, The Golden Micro Edge, was like a five-and-a-half-year endeavor. So it was great because I got to explore myself and, and memorialize all these strategies. But really, like, it, it's kind of cool to go back to an environment where now you're being taught, where – you're learning, you're being pushed to analyze things and look at things. And ultimately, law school is about 
it's about many things, but to me, it's about advocacy. How do you advocate a position? How do you convey a position? How do you succinctly and persuasively compel someone to take action? And honestly, I, I, was, I was poached by a Facebook ad. Can you believe that? I mean, I'll admit it right here on, 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 the, on the after hour show. <laughs> I was serving Facebook and like, and I saw a Pepperdine Law School ad. And I'm like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go. And I clicked on it and it was over. <laughs> Literally five well, weeks later, I was part of the, uh, the spring 2019 cohort for Pepperdine Law School, the online master legal studies program. And uh, well, that's a, I, uh, that's I spent a, great a lot of time st- reading law. So, yeah. That's a great story, but most people that go to uh, Las Vegas and try to do some personal growth, and they you were saying you're being taught. I think they they usually taught different things, especially at night. I would say than uh, what you're learning. So now, you know, also, like, you're not, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, I um, I mean, I, I you know, I lived I've lived in Vegas for 15 years, and I lived in New York City for eight years, and I did the bi coastal thing, and I also spent a lot of time in Santa Monica. I got to tell you, like, I am pretty boring. This whole trading futures thing full time, like, it kind of provides you with a sufficient amount of adrenaline when you, like, support yourself from your trading P&L. So the last thing I need on a Friday night is, like, I used to be a big sports better as well. But, like, that was, like, a lifestyle choice to, okay, no more of that. Futures trading, high leverage. This is probably enough adrenaline for me in my age. Right, so you're you're tr- you used to be a sports better. So let's talk a little bit about that because did you actually go out there to be a professional sports better? And what did you bet on? And like, how did that work? Yeah, no, I used to be very active sports better. Also a poker player. Played a lot of. We're talking now 2004 to 2006, which was kind of like the first sort of post Chris Moneymaker golden age of poker. Um, living here was great. I was living in California up to that point in time. Um, had a lot of things. There's a lot of shows. And I just love Las Vegas. Like it's, it's, there's no state income tax in Las Vegas, which is great if you're a native Californian to come and live here and the bad guys. I'm all about like creating structural edges, guys, you know? So, um, I just, you know, and I was also featured in a movie called life on the line. You can watch it on Hulu, I think where they were in 2010, they, they had a camera crew come around with me and some other sports handicappers as we like bet the Super Bowl, and they were filming us for a week. And it was really, a lot of fun. So, I mean, again, I, I have a lot of memories and fondness of sports betting and, uh, and playing poker, but like I have a two and a half year old daughter now. And like, honestly, trading the fed with leverage you just contracts is seriously enough juice guys. Like it's a lot of juice. in that. <laughs> so did, did the skills that you learned doing the sports betting and doing the, uh, the handicapping, like, did you, uh, it sounds to me at least, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you, that you've almost taken that idea and put it into these events and, and you're looking for those same kind of edges and you're just being very methodical about it. Cause that's the one thing about that people don't realize is that professional sports betters, it's not that it's, it's, it's also boring because it's a job and they have to go and treat it seriously. And they're not taking, you know, wild risks. They're trying to figure out times when the odds favor them and then betting bigger at that point. How much of the skills from sports betting are you applying on your actual futures trading? Well, it goes both ways. I mean, speculation is a skill in of itself, right? So when you think about, you know, how I manage risk, bankroll management, what the netto number is, okay? Like how I maximize return punitive risk. Did I take, I'll take a make up the number here. I have a thousand dollar sports betting bankroll. What does the equity curve of my sports betting bankroll look like? Is it suggested that I have an edge? What does the equity curve of my trading look like? Is that suggested that I have an edge? So I think, you know, it still comes down to, can you identify opportunities where they are mispriced? And then do you bet the appropriate amount based on that confidence interval? And that's something that whether you're betting on sports, you're playing poker, um, or you're betting on the markets is a skill that transcends all of those industries. Um, but there are different structural impediments or challenges with each one of those respective things. For example, as a poker player, you can play online, you can play live. If you play live, there are certain limits, there are certain house rules. Um, you may face some constraints. With sports betting, you could face jurisdictional legal issues, um, not here in Nevada per se. Also, liquidity may not be as good if you're on the market. Are you trading future stocks, options? Um, so knowing the rules of the game, which is actually a something they just pound on you in law school. Like you have to know the jurisdictional rules, which is like why we love using that word jurisdiction. Um, if you're going to have an expertise and have an edge and be successful. Okay. So now 
where is the well, that's best my after hours talk there. This is pretty intense. Right. So hours. where is the best <laughs> where is the best example of using that edge today? Like where are you focusing your energy? Like you told us about the Fed minutes and and, and, sure. and that you're trading sure. these events, but do you have anything sure. else or do you have any trades that you're like feel really strongly about that you know yeah, something no a little doubt. more no kind doubt. of no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Why, um, why don't you kind I think of right now the the trade is let's just follow the big money for there's a broader theme taking place in the market. And again I should stress the event trading is one, although an integral, it is only one aspect of all of my trading. Because if you simply become myopic on just one event and you haven't taken, um, you know, the, a mosaic of information and you don't have a broader appreciation of, of what's also happening, that can inhibit some of the P&L potential. But to your question about what trade I like right now, I think we're in a global freaking chase for yield, okay? And what that means is that at a broader, deeper more um, uh, strategic level, people and portfolio managers have been chasing yield for the last, well, for some time now. And what that means is if you have a theme, a macro narrative, a regime where I need to own long end of the treasury curve, all right, then you need to, use, then, then, then taking that and saying, okay, well, what else is out there? Well, let's look at dividend paying stocks, you know, XLP, for example, the ETF, if I look at the S&P right now, that's positive on the, on, on the day. XLY, okay, um, XLU, those are, the po- those are the parts of the S&P that are actually up today, whereas your beta names are down. So being aware of this beta versus dividend pain, understanding in a, you know, which part of that cycle we're in can still lend opportunities. You can still take this, these fundamental themes, all right, watch these money flows, and then apply a very tactical approach to this. And for me, it's using this weakness in the treasury market, um, to step in and buy it. Like if we get a headline and the, you know, treasury sells off five or seven basis points, that's just to come in and play a day trading scalp. All right. And that's what I talked earlier about being an analyst versus being someone that can make money. All right. The analyst talks about how interest rates have never been this historically low before, or, you know, this is something the trader says, okay, they're low. And there's this theme, there's this money flow in place. Now, how do I tactically take advantage of that? All right. So for me, that trade right now, is this broader chase for yield. And when you look at the S&P 500, it's very tough to see that going down too much as long as the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is paying more than two-year dividend yield, even five-year dividend yield right now, or the five-year treasuries right now. Okay, so you're understanding the, the, the macro trends that are in place and looking for selective opportunities to kind of take stabs at it and, and some take some good like uh, good risk return bets, if I, if I understand Place good correctly. tactical bets now, based on those things, correct, yes. Right. So now, for example, like let's talk about XLU. It's, it's up on a stick. It just continues to go higher no matter what. Um, at what point would you be saying – this is getting frothy. It's getting risky. Or, or at what point would you say the trend has changed? Like, how would you, how would you take that macro theme and identify when it is shifted? Watch your PNL, my friend. Your PNL will tell you when that macro <laughs> shift is, is shifted. Okay. You, when I buy the dip three times and I got and I'm looking at brackets instead of green. You know what I mean? When I got parentheses around the, the trades of buying that yep. dip on the XLU. That's a good sign that maybe the macro trend is changing. And I don't need somebody on CNBC to tell me that, oh, rates are going higher. I'm going to short utilities. You know what I mean? Because if I'm doing my job, if I'm identifying these opportunities, but guess what? I may make 8 out of 10 or 15 out of 20 winners before I, before I see that degradation in that strategy. Okay? Right. And so that flow is, 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 is one of many things that I like to do is, is P&L attribution. P&L attribution can be so vital. To, uh, to understand the macro narrative and, and, and looking at the market through that, you know, right, well, what's the netto number on that? Is the netto number, you know, is the return period of risk beginning to decay, which we talked about extensively in the global macro edge, how to use the netto number, what the netto number is, how to compute it, et cetera. But that's, you know, that's the first way, P&O and netto number. So, so it, one second, Patrick, I got to, it's Kev still, yeah. I got to, because this is one of my pet peeves is that I find um, a lot of people that say they're technical ana- analysts and they're all trying to fight the stock market rise. And I, I've always said, you know, aren't technicians supposed to be Jesus. more kind of, uh, no, aren't they supposed to be more trend followers? And, uh, and, and you just said, uh, you, John just kind of pointed out, he said, as long as it's going up, I'm going to continue doing it. And to me, it's, it's wow. still going up. 
Sorry, go ahead, John. The, the context of that, though, is critical because pigs get fat or hogs get slaughtered, okay? And yeah. you can be a mean reversion trader and do very well. You can be a trend follower and do very well. Technical analysis is the tool that facilitates those strategies. But to me, understanding the macro narrative behind the technical analysis is at its core the global macro edge. So if you want to be on some time frame or based on some strategy, you want to sell premium. You want to buy premium. You want to sell tops. So you want to, you know, when, when you get oversold or overbought, that strategy, and then and you can overlay a macro narrative on top of it. For example, the S&P 500 has been rallying like crazy, okay, over the last seven years. So shorting it just simply because you want to short it makes no sense to me. However, if we get some technical bearish formation and you compound it with a, pre, a Fed press conference where all of a sudden um, Powell surprises us and says, um, you know, despite the market pricing us in, we're still, we still find the data very encouraging and we remain patient. However, at this point in time, um, market expectations for rate cuts may have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves, okay? Now I'm going to ask you a question, okay? At that point in time, the next sell trigger again in the S&P has a lot more teeth to it, okay? If I have so, a moving average crossover, I have some basic entry system, because Powell just freaking dropped the bomb on you, all right? So guess what? No matter, like, now you can overlay the technical analysis with this fundamental regime shift Okay, and you can use that as a way to get in, and you can use the way to manage your risk. Right. So you're so at though at the end of the day, you that macro understanding is what's driving trades, and you're using technical as a timing tool and a and a risk like as a a way of establishing good risk reward trades. And on top of that, quantitative analysis through unit of risk ratio, such as the netto number, agony ecstasy ratio to take a more broader look at the market and analyze different aspects of it to identify where money flows are at. So by combining okay. with what I, what I just told you with, oh, and also money flows on top of that are now going to the wrong end. Because in that case there, I'd buy 30 years, I'd buy 10 years futures, I'd sell S&P, I'd sell high yields, because guess what? You know what I mean? I'd sell, I'd buy the dollar, I'd short emerging markets on all that scenario right there. So I build all these things, I could hit one button or I could have it automated and boom, you know, like, Done. The basket goes out. I'm in. That, and we did not talked about how I can structure that around options. Okay. Where, because I'll tell you this, the options market maker doesn't know the macro narrative like I do. He doesn't have these tools. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You're, so the Mac, the option trader is just looking at it often. Like I, I used to be an institutional equity option market maker. And I understand that when Patrick comes to me with his strategies, <laughs> no, honestly, Patrick, yeah, yeah. I'm impressed by your strategies. I always kind of look at them and, 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 and you're, you're creating positions that will behave a certain way based upon what you think the market's going to do. I didn't look at that at all. I looked at like implied volatilities and I was either long or short gamma. And I was worried about uh, the volatility around that price. And that's all I cared about. And there was there, I never once thought to myself, well, you know, like I, I think I could create a two to one call spread or whatever. That was never a trade. I'll like, cause I was always Delta hedging it. So yeah. there is a, a possibility and I, I've come to realize and appreciate Patrick's kind of approach where he can create positions uh, that, that benefit from specific market outcomes. So I'd love to hear John, you talk about how you could use um, options to create a risk reward scenarios that are favorable to you and while combining it with your macro kind of understanding? Sure. So there's a couple of factors of that. One is what I would define as temporal granularity. And by temporal granularity, I mean that we have so many options out there that have so many different expiries. So the temporal aspect obviously being the expiry and the frequency of those expiries, the granularity meaning I can buy them every 50 cents in crude. I can buy them every $5 in gold. I can buy them every five points on the S&P. So we take an event like maybe a non-farm payroll or an election results or some sort of macro event. And because I can buy an option expires tomorrow, you as a market maker just simply don't have the background or the comprehension of that in, 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 a, in a large enough data set, you could appropriately price those options. So now not only am I just simply making a directional call, I could define my risk. And in a market where premium selling has done so well over the last five, six, seven years, I mean, most of the, you know, yeah. we have had our, a few XIV moments, but by and large, people who have been buying options the last five years more broadly have been struggling. 
whereas those who've been selling have, have done particularly well given this record bull market and the ball suppression we've seen with central bank puts out there. However, when we find situations where um, the market's been caught off sides, like back in December of, of 2018 or, or other events, the one day options expire that are 20 points away. Well, you, you, I'm sure, would say, well, the, well, gee, the S&P only sells down 2%, you know, um, only has a 200 basis point move, one out of every 79 days, okay? So based on that, I should price this option two points. But that's incorrect. Because what just happened puts us in a category where the chance of moving down 2% is actually 30% on the day, not 2%, okay? And so that temporal granularity provides opportunity that when there is a shift, when there is an event that happens, you can take advantage and exploit that because what, what, what now being that most of this options market making stuff is automated, they're using large data sets. The, the big firms out there, the citadels of the world, all those firms that, that are making markets here are rigorously quantitative, but they don't get the macro context for those unique opportunities, and that's where they must be exploited. And so are you, you're generally a buyer of options. You're not, and you're just looking for kind of situations where you think that the, the possibility of a, of a larger move are underpriced and underappreciated by the market makers. Just like Toronto was underappreciated against the Golden State Warriors. Toronto came in the <laughs> series as a Love it. Oh. dog. Whoa. Yeah. I just dropped that bomb on you guys. Okay. Yeah, no, so, you know, so, out there. So wait, so are you you're you were a sports better? Did what did you think yeah. going into it? Like what were what were I thought your thoughts? I, I, thought, you, I, thought, I, I made the series pick them. And, and it's easy to say in hindsight, oh gee, you made the series pick them because and, and believe me, I listen to the Visa Network. I love the show. I have many, many former colleagues who are sports better, so I can still make a market. In fact, I, was, I made one of the first in-game betting models here in 2010 when Cantor Gaming introduced in-game betting to Las Vegas. And so I'm routinely, if you can go back to my tweets from the U.S. Super Bowl, I'm like putting out, um, you know, in-game sports lines over under. So like, I'll make a market on a sports bet on a series in a heartbeat. Okay, and I made the series pick them. All right, but again, it's just one more thing to, to deal with. But I'm just don't I just don't sports, but I haven't been a sports bet in six years. All right. Okay. Just, so what did you yeah. one second now? What did you see? Why were you why did you feel that way? Walk us okay, through so your in, thinking. in the similar way that the, my unit of risk ratios, if you want to refer to them metaphorically, about the Golden State Warriors, were suggested that this is a team that was fading. Um, the metrics like so for example, I measure what's called max favorable excursion versus max adverse excursion on, on a market. So if, let's say the S P today is up twenty points. As at one point in time was up 20 points, but another time was down 40 points. Okay. And let's say it closes with unch. To me, the fact that it was down two times the amount that it was up is instructive. Okay. And could lead to understanding. Just like if you look at a strategy, if you find that it's taking a lot of drawdown, but okay, it's still making money, that could be a warning sign that there's model decay in that strategy. So let's look now at the Golden State Warriors and you want to find sort of a, an analogy of how it would transport over. Um, that universe ratio to the Golden State Warriors. In the series against Portland, in the four-game sweep, all right, Portland led the majority of time in that series. The matchups which Golden State was able to exploit pertain to Portland not having their starting center. The length, okay, the length of Toronto presented particular matchups without Kevin Durant because Kevin Durant is your 20-foot spot-up shooter that can basically negate the edge. And you saw that when Durant came and played. There's no doubt in my mind if Durant's healthy, Golden State wins that series in five. Okay, he was that much of a matchup edge against Toronto that if he's if Golden State's at their full strength, you're talking Golden State's probably minus five five fifty. Okay, however, given where Golden State was at, given the lack of that key matchup edge with Durant and the home court advantage and and the athleticism of Toronto to now actually force Curry and the inability to defend because Durant is a huge defender as well, had a huge impact. Okay, and people were asking the wrong question. So for me, I made the, I made the series pick them, all right? And obviously, Golden State was a $3, plus back was 260 And the money came in from, from, from a lot of retail people out there on Golden State. Now, some professional bettors here in Las Vegas, more Toronto side, they were never going to lay the $3 on Golden State. But that series was a classic example of, let's look at the last five years, let's look at you know some other stats, and we'll make Golden State the $3 favorite. That was just a fucking misprice. Sorry. That was just a misprice. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. Misprice. Okay, so you said the you know the betters were asking the wrong questions. What is the what are investors asking the wrong questions of today? 
oh my back God, to the market. Don't give me another layup question like that. So the, the problem Come is, on, though. Like, I, I, asking, I would love to hear it. Yeah. Investors ask, what are my returns? When they should be asking, what are my returns per unit of risk? And understanding what your returns per unit of risk are means that you know going into an investment, what is my risk budget? How much am I risking in this investment? Because you simply want to say, oh, I made 10%. Well, 10% relative to what? Were you risking 10% of your portfolio? Were you risking 50% of your portfolio? Or were you risking your entire portfolio? What was the nature of that risk? How leveraged was that portfolio? What capacity constraints were there? Is this scalable? Okay. Simply saying, what were my returns is not the right question. And what I do, and it's, you know, it sounds a little pitchy, and my apologies, but you've got to know the right context, that three-dimensionality. If you don't know what those returns were relative to what was actually at risk, then you don't have a complete story. And you're likely to make serious, significant investment mistakes as a result of that. No. Oh. Well, that's words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. <laughs> All right. Words well, of painful jo- experience, more like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, you know what? Listen, for I'm just going to make the pitch again. Our listeners, make it out to Chicago and join Kevin Muir, John Neto, and myself out for drinks after this uh, Macro Edge event on Sunday, July 21st. There's no tickets or anything. Just we're going to uh, announce what bar we're going to be drinking at. And our listeners are going to be welcome to, to join us and uh, for a couple drinks and shoot the shit. And we got, it's going to be a great time out in Chicago. So, you Patrick, know, John, one second. What, one second what, what, before what? You, do, you said a couple of drinks. These are Chicagoans. I'm sure it'll be more than a couple, but. No. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, right. we're gonna, right. So we better we we better we better be drinking sessionable beers then. That's right. But, they better be sessionable. <laughs> but listen, John, it was great to have you on. Uh, this conversation to is going to be continued. Like that's uh, it was great. In you know? Chicago and uh, exactly. in Chicago great, and guys. And next time I'm in Vegas, we'll uh, we'll have to go for a couple drinks as long as it doesn't interfere with your law school. <laughs> That's right. It was, it was no a pleasure worries. meeting you, John. I'm looking good reading material for you. <laughs> That's right. It was a pleasure meeting you, John. I'm looking forward to our debate. Patrick's going down. It's going to be ugly, and uh, I'm glad you'll be there to witness it. I will, Patrick, Kevin. You guys are awesome. Have a wonderful weekend, and, and, and thanks to everyone for listening to the podcast. Be, be good, guys. Good luck in the market. Uh, thanks. Thanks All right, again, thanks John. a lot, John. Okay, that was, that was a pretty good show, I guess. Lena, you there? Lena. Yeah. What do you think? So, well, though, before you say anything, Lena, what do you think about the picture of me going scuba diving? Well, I know that Patrick had pointed out about the propane tank and the garden hose and whatever, but I'm thinking, this is supposed to be Kevin. He's got all the hair. That's <laughs> right. That's not me. <laughs> I also have a little bit of a tan. Uh, yeah, a little bit is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where does Kevin find all these images? Uh, well, that's yeah, in my no, but that's database. a secret. That's a trade. That's a trade secret. Like, you're, a, you're not gonna find. Well, them. you know what you don't know is that all the pictures that are not safe, I'm not allowed to use. Oh. I have like a, the inner da- the database of the of the unusable macro tourist pictures are quite extensive. Does that it, does that include the pregnancy photo shoot that you had with Mrs. Macro Tourist? <laughs> no, that yes. does not. Yeah, it, it does. I'm sure it does. I was already oh, hungover before we started recording, and I'm already oh, getting sloshed, and I'm listening you know to what? you guys like rant. This, it's blaring. I I had. I had two of these uh, beers during this uh, episode, and at seven percent, I have to say, like, it, I feel pretty good. This is you know what the problem know, is. Like, we're we're taping a little early too, and if you don't eat lunch or whatever, and you're just well, I didn't eat like, lunch. I'm, I'm having lunch still. right now with the beer. <laughs> yeah, the liquid lunch. That's right. So, no, but, but I was just. Like, I liked it actually. I thought it was a great name. It's great picture. It, it was very suitable beer. It it didn't actually have any sediment at the bottom of it on mine at least. So I was quite pleased. I don't know. I drank it too fast. Like. <laughs> the sediment when I just <laughs> shook mine. Oh, so the sediment was part of it. I like it. But yeah, when I was listening to you guys talking about rem- uh, what is it called? Reminiscence. Remember? Stock operator. And oh, you guys, were, you guys were disagreeing, and then Patrick, you were like, "Really? You disagree with me?" And I'm just thinking, "Why are you surprised? You guys always disagree. <laughs> so why are you surprised? I don't understand. <laughs> what is, What is this about?" Uh, 
Oh, uh, you know what? This is, uh, it's always a pleasure to record with you, Kat. Just, to, uh, oh, just to get that on record. That, uh, no, because knowing Whoa. someone is on the other side of my trades all oh, the time is amazing. Such just crap. Just knowing who, you, who this person is. What, what's amazing is how even when you're offside, like huge, you'll be like, oh, I'm still going to get you and stuff like that. It's just it's going to be just like the, uh, the last year's bet. The recession was coming. If you bet every year I, I the recession's coming, if you bet the recession's coming I'm every year, one of these times you'll be right, Patrick. <laughs> so I figure it's a good bet because, I, like, let's you face know what? It. To be honest, I'll, I'll tell you mathematically, it will take seven years because there's, every year there's like a 15% chance of a recession, which is like a one in seven odds. And so inevitably, if I make this bet seven times in a row, I'm eventually going to get a stake. Yeah, but out. so there, Patrick, you're betting on a one to one payoff ratio. So. <laughs> that's not a good bet, buddy. Like, I, I don't. I do not think John Neto will approve. That's right. Of, that is. That is. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think the Neto ratio or whatever it is going to be pretty shit on that trade, I'm buddy. I'm pretty foobard on that trade. <laughs> There's no doubt about this. Uh, John Neto is going to be shaking his head right now, and he's listening. He's like, saying, no, that's not <laughs> let's face it, he isn't listening at this point. Very no. few people are listening at this point. Okay, and I'm calling it a day. I got to go. Yeah. It's a big weekend for me. Thanks for everything. Thanks, Lena. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Have a good weekend. All right. Have a good night. Take Cheers, care. Cheers, guys. Bye.